So no, I have three phones total. Oh, okay. Yep. So the other one's got like a leopard print back on it. I don't think I left it. Maybe it's in the ceiling. No, it's not in the ceiling. Let's check under here. Is that it on your table? No, this one's mine. That one's yours? Yeah. We're working on it, guys. We have to find the other devices that we just lost just now <laughs> as we're oh, standing my. here. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my glasses. That's helpful. I'm going to go double check my car real quick, I guess. It was a nightmare coming in here. Put it in here. No. everyone if you're just joining us my name is Kim I teach upholstery and right now I'm trying to find all my devices so I can get on all the platforms because time is slipping away from me so feel free to get settled in talk amongst yourselves oh and is that plugged in good that is plugged in this one can't get set up yet where would it be? You can feel free to talk. You don't need to. <laughs> you don't need to be quiet. It's not that kind of thing. Okay. Uh, fuck. Think, 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 think. Did I leave this room? I don't think I have. I'm gonna check my. There's my. There's my. Ooh, plugged in. Ah, yes. Ah. Yeah! I'm like, why would it be at the front desk? I know why. Okay, this one is about to go on Facebook. So we're trying to get uh, as many angles as we can. We're having one device failure, so I don't know if we're gonna get all three angles at the same time, but we're for sure gonna be on TikTok and Instagram. That's what we're moving towards. I think Instagram doesn't have a thing that you can um, set up that'll stream it also to Facebook at the same time? I believe so. I believe if you go live on Instagram, you ought to go live on Facebook, I think. Don't quote me on that, because I don't do IG lives too often, but I'm, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I might have to go live on TikTok from this device. And then move the other, like rotate device? Yeah. Okay. No, she took that off too. Sorry guys, we're having some login issues. We thought we were ready. It's all right. Okay, I am logged in on Facebook, so if I just download Instagram, I should be able to log in. Okay, while well, that downloads. My name is Kim, my good friend Thomas uh, of Tusano Trading Company. Here he is. Hi. He's going to be assisting me today doing a lot of camera magic for me so that you guys can see more of me and more of what it is I do. I'm so fucking grateful for him because there's like a monitor over there that has like <laughs> all of the chat feeds going at the same time. So if you're tuning in from TikTok or you're tuning in from Instagram or you're tuning in from Facebook, he's got you covered. He's yeah. going to help read off questions for me so that I can stay on top of those. Uh, I'm really happy to have you here. I see we're all starting to pile in. Right now, like as we kind of just chit chat about, I'm uh, trying to get all the devices logged in. So the goal is to get three different angles. One from in front so you can see me speaking and see what it is that I'm doing. And then we're gonna try and have one hovering right above so that you can see what's going on with my hands. And then we're going to also have uh, just like a close up of the actual, like hovering in the air, an aerial shot of that. So you're gonna get three different angles at any given time. Yes, that is exactly what I'd like to do right now. 
and I will be monitoring chat from the different platforms. That's We actually have a big 55-inch TV set up with the three platforms, and I'll kind of be watching the chat for questions. When I'm not like on camera or getting stills, we also have a, a Canon DSLR over here that's going to be taking stills from the stream. So you might hear Kim call for like a still shot and then see me move something. That's what will be going on there. But I'll be doing my best to monitor chat and answer questions and read them off to him. Excellent. Okay, so now we're live on Instagram. So I'm going to actually, I am going to need your assistance for this. Okay. Um, if you could just get this camera kind of in the same position as this one is. Okay. So that Front in facing or back facing? Uh, I want to see me, I want to okay. see what they're seeing. So you'll have to flip the camera around. Got it. Um, so I can see them on the screen. Yeah, and then just find, I don't know if there's, there was another one of these tripods. Yes. There might be pieces for cameras in my toolbox over here. Yep. I, well, I've got the, the stuff over here. I've got the attachment. Oh, great. Taking it apart earlier, so I'll put it back together. Fantastic. So this is, uh, this is a pretty casual affair, you guys. Uh, we're, <laughs> we're, we're doing this live, of course, so that you can learn, but we're also capturing content for longer form videos later on down the road. So there's a lot of camera movement. Thomas is going to be great here, and he's going to help assist me with the comment section, which has already got comments in it. So he's got a monitor over here that's got all three chats going at the same time. We're going to have Facebook up and running soon, but we are having a device failure. So right now we're just going to be going live on TikTok and Instagram. If you're joining me on Instagram, hello. Let's get that camera raised up to the proper millennial yeah. height because <laughs> that is way too it. low. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, uh, I'm going to get on here on TikTok and read some of the questions that I have so far. Is that a Ooh, I need these. A little bit better at that height? Yeah, I think so. Let me get over on this side so I can see. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's really good. That's okay. perfect. Cool. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm going to let Thomas read the questions. Oh, yep. He's yeah, going to go get that set up. And while Thomas is queuing up the questions, Thomas, you just let me know when you're ready. I am going to tell you guys a little bit more about me. So let me get this over here. <clears throat> I promise if you get the comments in the section, Thomas is going to do his best to answer them. That's still not yeah. great. Currently modern TikTok, let me see. We've got proper millennial height. Uh, so cool. Hold on. Ta pause on that for one second. I'm almost ready to answer those questions. Okay, so my name is Kim and I teach upholstery. I uh, have been doing upholstery for a little over a decade professionally or right around a decade professionally. I am self-taught um, professional. I taught myself by pulling furniture out of the trash and restoring it. And at first it was just posting it on Facebook. There was no Facebook marketplace at the time. There was just Facebook groups and so People would share their stuff in Facebook groups and other people would buy them. It was a very volatile place. If you were the first person in the comment section, like you owned that piece, whether we liked it or not. I got kicked out of a lot of groups in the early days, that's for sure. Um, so I've been doing this for quite some time. My husband and I had a fabrication business, uh, a brick and mortar for about six years, uh, which is what we thought we really wanted to do. We were so excited to run our own business and to make cool things. Uh, and to be a part of changing the landscape of the, the cities around us, it was a lot of fun, but it was so much work and we burnt out. We, it was unsustainable. We worked seven day weeks, 15 hour days. We never got vacation. We were just work, work, working for six like straight years. And the kids were raising the shop. It sounds like a dream, but it was a fucking nightmare. And there was a lot of like challenging times. Uh, we tried to hire more people so that we could keep up with the demand and there just wasn't anybody there to help us. Nobody knew how to do this. So after we closed our business, I decided I wanted to try and teach as many people how to do upholstery as possible. So maybe one day I could get back into doing it. And that's kind of like a phase that I'm working on transitioning into right now. So it's been a couple of years. It's been a little over two years since we closed our business. And since then I weird off and I started teaching upholstery workshops online. And then that went from teaching online to when we moved, I found a, a maker space, this beautiful place called Maker Works here in Ann Arbor, Michigan, who had space where I could rent a, a room and I could teach my upholstery workshops out of here. So that started, uh, it was a year ago last October, I started teaching upholstery workshops. And since then, I've taught close to 300 people from this room. And it's a class that's up to six people at a time. 
and uh, we have 60% of those students are returning to do more furniture. So we are doing it. We are training more people, and it's really cool. I have about a, half, a, a dozen or so people who are taking on clients who have been students. We've had some job placements. It's been really cool to sort of see people turn this skill into like an extra form of income for themselves or even just like building up your own self-confidence. It's been really cool for me. I'm really happy to be back doing it um, for the fun of it and for the love of it and to be able to show you guys how to do it. So if you've never been here before, I do tutorial Tuesdays from about 10 a.m. to 2 p.m.-ish every Tuesday. So if you want to learn upholstery and you want to learn it for free, this is the place to find me. And I usually go on TikTok because I got a bigger numbers on TikTok that I get usually anywhere else. And today is a rare occasion where I'm actually trying to get live on all the platforms. Uh, we do have a device failure, so we haven't made it up to Facebook yet. If you're watching from TikTok or uh, Instagram and you're part of the local upholstery club page on Facebook, please post a link to both of these in that group so that people know and then let them know we're having a little bit of trouble in the Facebook arena. Originally, that wasn't even part of the plan, but we got real cocky this morning and we thought we were going to be able to do three cameras all at once and it took me 45 minutes to make the video to show you that we were going to use three cameras and i only use one camera to make that video so we have to get the other phone hooked up so that we can get facebook going but we're going to be here all day so the plan is thomas is here to help read off your questions so that i i can answer them and he's also here to help me move the cameras around so that you guys can see things from different angles so i want you to be able to see me talking because sometimes it's really important especially especially accessibility wise for people to be able to see my face and my mouth move while I do that. And then we're also going to have a camera on my hands, either hovering above aerial style or right the like point of view view of my hands. So that way you guys can see exactly what it is that I'm doing. I'm going to do my best to slow down and explain things thoroughly to you, what it is that I'm doing, why I'm doing it and how you can apply it to other projects. If you have any questions as we move forward, put them in the comment section. Thomas is going to read them off to me and I'm going to do my best to answer as many as we can. I see we have a ton coming in already. So uh, let's get started on reading those off and then we'll get uh, going on the actual project, which is reupholstering this uh, chair behind me. If you've been joining me for Tutorial Tuesday for the past few weeks, we have been stripping this chair, uh, reupholstering it, painting the wood finish, doing all kinds of stuff, and today we're ready to do the fabric. We're going to be putting this fabric on the front, and I'm hoping we get a surprise guest of the back fabric, because that's supposed to arrive today, but anytime before seven, and I don't know if we'll get to it in time, but also I don't know if we're going to get to the back in time before I have to be out of here today. So we're going to definitely do the front of this chair, and if we still have time, we're gonna do the front of the other chair, so you'll get to watch it twice. I have two chairs just like this. I'm making a dining room set. I don't know if you guys have been following along, but you can go to my TikTok or any of my social media platforms and see the um, Peony dining room table that I'm making with a ShopBot CNC router. And this is part of the dining chairs that are going to be going with it. So that'll be something that's available on my website later on. Um, and I think that is as much as I can blab around before I answer any questions. Are you ready, Thomas? Yeah. Okay, let's yeah. hear it. Yeah. Um, anyway, let's see. So Jillian says, uh, already shared info to my maker space for a camp, hopefully in Phoenix. So I guess Yeah, so what Jillian is talking about is okay. uh, this spring and summer. So last year I did three very successful upholstery retreats here locally in Ann Arbor. We stayed at the Newton of Ypsilanti, which is a bed and breakfast in a mansion in the historic town of downtown Ypsilanti. It's a beautiful place, chef prepared meals, uh, it, like a big giant fireplace. Like it's just the most beautiful space. And then during the day we would come here and we would do eight hours of upholstery, three days straight. We had guest speakers who would speak to us at lunchtime. All your meals are included. It was a really great experience that sold out twice. Uh, and it's something that I wanted to make accessible to more people. So this spring and summer, we're actually going on the road and we're going to be making relationships with other maker spaces so that I can come and teach my weekend retreats at maker spaces across the United States. 
Uh, DIY Cave is one of those maker spaces that we are connected with right now. They are choosing a weekend, and so we will be going to Bend, Oregon, maybe for two weeks, potentially for two weeks in a row. And in between those two weeks, if everything works out, we're going to be teaching classes in between, so you'll be able to take classes all that week. Um, so what Jillian is talking about is if you have a makerspace near you and you would like to see me come and teach a workshop, I encourage you to call that makerspace, tell them who I am, tell them where to go. There's a link in my bio that talks about my weekend upholstery camps. And if you're the one who connects me to that makerspace, then you will get to attend that camp for free. So it's a really good opportunity to take a whole weekend of upholstery workshops and, and get that for free and join me and have a really good time. Um, and it's a really good way for you to promote your local makerspace because not a lot of people know this, but makerspaces really kind of struggle to keep up momentum, uh, keeping people there. It's the most incredible resource that you'll ever see. This particular makerspace is 14,000 square feet. It's here in Ann Arbor, Michigan. It's called MakerWorks. Thomas is a maker here too, and he also runs his business out of here, Tucsono Trading Company. He's a woodworker. He makes a lot of gaming accessories, cutting boards, charcuterie board. I don't know if I said that right. Yeah. S'mores boards, margarita board, like a lot of really cool uh, natural wood stuff. So you guys got to check him out. You can check him out on Instagram. You can check him out on TikTok. You can check him out on Facebook. He's everywhere. Uh, he's doing a really incredible thing for me today. And he actually gave me a microphone. So if you're listening from TikTok, you can see me or you can hear me really well. OK, ready for the next question. Oh, thank you. I agree. <laughs> uh, Sarah, Sarah Turner, another kind of compliment or statement. Love seeing you pop up on Tuesdays. That's so fun. Thank you guys so much for joining me. Oh, by the way, I'm going to take this time to remind you that when you guys are in here, you have to be engaging with this in order for it to work, in order for people to like be here. So when I remind you, if you can just tap the screen, I don't know if it works the same way on Instagram because I don't do a lot of lives there, but I'd like you to like this as much as possible. On TikTok, you can tap, 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 violently tap, and the little pink heart is going to show up in the upper left-hand corner, and you can try and get to make it to the end of it, and it throws your big party. It's fun for you. It's fun for me. It's way more more valuable than you guys purchasing likes or gifts or whatever to give to me because I only get fractions of those pennies and then TikTok gets the rest of it. But when you guys are in here and you're tapping on the screen and you're liking and you're engaging and you're asking questions or you're sharing it with your friends, you're actually sending my content through the For You pages or through the feeds so that more people see it, more people find me, they learn about my upholstery workshops, they learn about how to take classes, whether they're in person and virtual, and they learn how to do upholstery. And then you guys are actively saving the upholstery industry. <laughs> And it's not, it's, I'm not being dramatic. Like you really are, there's not a lot of upholsterers left here in the United States and we're really struggling to keep businesses alive because there's not enough skilled trades people in the field. So I'm here to teach as many people how to do this as possible. I'm working on projects on Tuesdays anyways. So if you're joining me live, you're just seeing the stuff that I'm working on and I'm happy to teach you about what it is that I'm doing. Okay, let's go over to Instagram. I don't know where we're at. I see a lot of stuff going on in there. I know her. So glue gun recommendations, anything that is a high temp hot glue gun used with high temp hot glue. You can use fabric glue if you want, but it's just a high temp hot glue. It's important that the glue gun liquefy the hot glue in order for it to fuse to the fabric properly, in order for it to be stable like moving down. Craft glue isn't going to work. It's going to dry up. I use this uh, little tiny hot glue gun from Home Depot in its Aero brand, I believe. It's a little red one, and it has a little precise micro tip on it. I am a mess with hot glue, so the micro tip is really helpful to me so that I don't make a mess of my upholstery projects. What else we got? Uh, let's see. What While you're finding them, I'm going to plug in my iron over here. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Is it Tim Hortons? Yeah, so <laughs> that's the problem, is that there, uh, ever since manufacturing went overseas and people began mass producing things overseas, taking jobs away from the United States, 
the job of an upholster has gotten smaller and smaller and smaller. So what happened is they stopped training people because they didn't want to breed competition because this is something you can do from your garage or your living room fairly easily. And it's such high demand, you're never going to not need upholstery ever. It's like just as popular as being a funeral director, I would think. Uh, like you're never, there's never going to not be a demand for it. So when everything went overseas and everything was being mass produced, those jobs became few and far between, and the trade stopped being passed on. So there's not a lot of people in the United States that teach it. There's no formal education for it, although I will say that there's about a dozen places that teach professional upholstery curriculums in the United States that you can join. And there are a handful of people like me and a lot of the upholsterers that are part of the new chair New Year Challenge here that also do their own versions of workshops either in their hometown or on the internet. So I encourage you to follow everybody that's part of this challenge. So uh, my suggestion to you would be to seek a local maker space and call them and ask them if they offer classes like that. And if they don't, you can send them over to the link in my bio that says weekend upholstery camps and tell them that I will come to them and teach upholstery classes from there and you can come to it. And if you are the one who connects me with that maker space, then I will let you join that whole weekend upholstery camp for free. That's like, that's the exciting part of it. What else we got? Because we got to get moving here in a minute. That's my, that's my girl. Yes. Hi, Lindsay. Um, follow uh, the whole new chair New Year. Thank you, Lindsay. <laughs> Lindsay, if you could list everybody in the comment section that everyone needs to follow so you can do it. So Lindsay, Madam of Making, is the mastermind of this whole New Chair New Year challenge. So there's seven of us who are working on upholstery projects this week uh, so that you can follow along, maybe learn a little bit about what it is that we do. And then there's chances to win prizes from all of us. I hear that there's a tool package. I'm not 100% sure everything that's there. I don't want to give anything away. But I am giving away a free Furniture Nerd hoodie as well as a four class package, either virtual classes or in-person classes that you can take with me to work on an upholstery project. All of my upholstery classes are bring your own project. So you bring your project to the table, whether that be in person or virtually, we do Zoom. Uh, and then I will help you through step by step through that project. You don't have to know what you're doing, no experience necessary. I'll let you know everything it is you need to get started and you can start at any time and you don't have to take all your classes consecutively. You can take them at your own convenience. My goal is to raise your confidence about approaching upholstery and approaching tearing apart a chair and putting something new on it because it can be really intimidating and I know that it tends to be a barrier to learning. So I want to remove as many barriers for you as possible. Is that it? So I see her posting. You can read off all of those. Yeah. Oh, from, yes. Um, I can't read the screen. Oh, wait, I'm going to just get up in there and read it. <laughs> no, hold on. Let me read it. Let me read it. They can hear me better over here. And I'm going to. It's embarrassing. I've been talking to these ladies all week, but all of their names consecutively, I can't keep in my brain. And so I need a list. Uh, okay, so we have the whimsical chair who actually started uh, posting her project yesterday. You'll be able to see more of that through the week. Me, Loco, Kim, uh, Blue Roof Cabin is also working on a project. Swatch Upholstery. Ooh, I get, I'm lost. Uh, uh, the Frederick House and Renewed by Riley, Madam of Making. Oh my gosh, I'm like really terrible at the screen stuff. I'm so glad that Thomas is here. So I'm losing my vision. This is a new fun thing that I get to experience. And uh, it makes it really difficult for me to continue to do my job because now I'm losing my vision and I can't use my friggin' hands anymore. So that's a fun thing. All right, I'm gonna put this here. Get this one here and we're gonna get started. So if you've been joining me uh, for these uh, Tutorial Tuesdays, live on Tuesdays on TikTok, then you've been watching me work on this chair. So this chair is part of a dining set that I'm working on. And today we're going to put, we're going to start off putting the front fabric on the chair. 
So you guys will learn how to measure and cut the patterns for the chair. Uh, we're going to be sewing three panels together. So you're also going to learn how to cut that to fit it and pattern make to the chair, as well as how to sew it on an industrial sewing machine. Once we've done that, we're going to apply all of the fabric to the chair. We're going to sew some welts to go along the edge, and then we're going to... Once we've done that, we're going to apply all of the fabric to the chair. We're going to sew some welts to go along the edge, and then we're going to get to the back panel before this. It's all going to depend on how quickly we move through this live before 2 p.m. What time we got, Thomas? 10.30? 10.30. Yeah. We might, it's early. It's only, we're only at 10.30, so there might be plenty of time there. I have pre-cut some panels, but I am going to go through the effort of showing you guys how to measure for that. So, Thomas, now I'm going to put you to work yes. moving my Instagram camera up above the chair. And I believe in this corner, no, in this corner right here was where I was earlier where you could see the whole thing okay. this one here and keep it so that I can see like the screen facing me I really appreciate you guys being uh, patient as we navigate oh, these I camera know. angles so I need it up in the ceiling tile the oh. phone so you oh, can okay. take it off of Got the it. tripod while I do this this is something that I learned in that last video that I did that actually it works really good as a phone stabilizer so while I move this I have a question from a uh, Miss something or other in chat. Miss something or other. Hi, Miss something or other. I'm trying to remember all the different names. Okay. Hi, it's okay. Mike. You don't have to remember names. I mean, okay. Questions are the important part. So they are talking about what seems to be a very. Um, uh, right in this corner. Oh, like, right in this corner. Yeah. Okay. Let's see if I can. If you you can move it um, so that one side is all the way. Got Perfect. It. Okay. Oh. Oop. And oh. then the bottom will be push the bottom. In, no, no, no. In the frame oh. that way. Okay. Yeah. Got it. All right. Yeah, isn't that great? Look oh, yeah, awesome. Look at that. Okay. So uh, they were they were talking about they have a very um, special chair, uh, a brand that I don't know, but you might. Um, and I promise you will this. Uh, Drexel, oh, Drexel. Drexel. Drexel yeah. Very um, popular furniture. <laughs> some know-how well what I will say is cambric is like a dollar a yard at Michael's so don't be afraid to take the cambric off because you can always put that back on okay. and the other thing I'll say is tying springs even as intimidating as it might sound is actually not very difficult and 100% of all of my students do it right 100% of the time it has only stressed out a couple of students on me, but they all did really, really good. So we're going to move this. If you're watching from Instagram and TikTok, you will see the uh, two different vantage points right now. So oh, I don't know where I'm going with this thing or even what the plan is. Um, so let's put this this way. Yeah. Oh, so what we're doing is we're measuring for this fabric right now. And be prepared to move. I forgot what we were doing. Be prepared to move this camera here in a minute, Thomas. All right. This is going to get um, real inconvenient real quick. So I need to research. She asked, so I need to research tying springs. Yes. And if you're a part of... Um, I'm right here. If you're on Facebook, I have a private group called the Lulco Upholstery Club. I have tutorials and everything in there. We're working on getting everything to YouTube. Listen, editing videos is really fucking hard. So that's back burner stuff. But um, you can join that group. And if you're working on a project from home and you need help, you can make a post and tag me in it. I can help you, of course, but there are close to 900 people in that group now of various levels of experience from looky lose to people who have been doing it for five decades. So there's a lot of support in there and everybody is in there to support you like 100% of the way. If you're DIY and you're coming and you're teaching yourself and you're not 100% there, nobody's going to call you out on it. And if you're, they're not going to give you that help unless you ask for it. But let me tell you, ask for it because they're giving away this information freely. And it's something you can learn and do for free from home. I did. I taught myself upholstery and I built a business out of it and worked like that for over six years. So uh, you can do it too. It's a lot of fucking hard work and it's really stressful and it's not cupcakes and rainbows, but it is a really cool way to make a living. Um, and I get pretty excited about it every day. 
So we're going to measure this chair right now. First, I want to show you how to measure for fabric. So you can figure out how much fabric you're going to need to upholster this piece. Now I have, I'm using one type of fabric on the front and then I'm going to use another type of fabric on the back. So I need to measure how much fabric I'm going to need from the front and then how much fabric I'm going to need from the back. Now when I teach my students about uh, measuring for fabric, most upholstery bolts come in 54 inch widths. That's standard, but they can come as like small as 42. They can come, I've had 120 widths one before. That's like unheard of, but it was really cool fabric. So they come in multiple widths. Important for you to know what that width is when you're making a pattern, but when you're new and you're just getting started and you don't have any precedent, I suggest don't assume you can get more than one part of your pattern out of the width of a bolt. That way you're going to have a little bit of extra material there to use if you make any mistakes. So what I'm going to teach you how to do is just to measure the lengths of your panels and that is going to be how you calculate how many yards you need for a piece of furniture. So this particular chair has one, two, three, four, five, but possibly seven panels depending on how I put the back together. So I am using two different fabrics for this chair, a blue velvet for, or a teal velvet for the front, and I'm using a floral velvet in the back. So I am just measuring how much material I'm going to need for this chair. So this already has the foam and everything on it. If you don't have your foam and everything on it, then you're going to have to accommodate for that in your measurements. So take all your measurements and then add the thicknesses of your foam. If you have two inch foam on the back of your seat, you're looking at adding two inches for the top and two inches for the bottom because it has to go around both of those. So that's actually four inches. So just double whatever thickness of the measurement of your foam is to your measurement. I always like to make sure I have at least two inches to hold on to on my ruler because that's how much I need to hold on to. I also have carpal tunnel and I have a difficult time pinching, so you might only need one inch to hold on to. Uh, and you'll want to conserve fabric as much as possible, but when you're brand new at this, you don't want to cut it just exactly enough because if you cut it just exactly enough, you're not going to have enough for tolerance and you're not going to have enough to make any tiny mistakes. And you want to build in a, a little bit of a handicap for yourself when you're doing this so that you have a tolerance. So always round up, always overestimate, uh, and then you uh, will have a better experience doing this. So I'm going to turn the TikTok camera to face me and I think I already have Instagram up. So the first thing I want to do, just to show you where these panels are. So we have a panel for the back of the seat a panel for each of the arms and a panel for the seat. So this panel has to staple to the back, come through the front and then into the frame and it has to attach to the frame in the back. So I need a piece that's long enough to staple to the back, come through the front, go through the seat and staple to the back. So I use a fabric tape to do this. You can also use a piece of string and then take it to a ruler. So if you don't have one of these, you can do that. These are a dollar or two at Joanne Fabrics. I have a bajillion of them around here. They all have blue stain around them because this is how I wear it around my neck. So uh, it's, these are good things to have around. So the first measurement I'm going to do is I actually start on the back here move this so Instagram can see. I hold it at two inches and then I hold it where the staple needs to go on the back. Now if everything is covered with your fabric you might not know where that is but overlap the back enough like an inch or two so that you know that you have enough material to staple on the back there. And then this little tail is going to go through the seat through the back. My openings are open right now so I can tuck this right through but these openings are not open if your seat is fully upholstered. So you're going to have to estimate the math between the crack of your seat through the outside of the back of your chair. So you can wait, you can get the back of your chair off and taken off completely and get all your pull through spots unstapled so that you can run this through, or you can just guess, you could add six inches. I don't know. You, you can overestimate just about anything. So I'm going to run this through. 
and I'm measuring the longest point of the back. Some chairs are shaped different. Some of them have a hump on the top. You're always gonna wanna measure from the longest point because that's what you're going to need to cut it. No matter what shape your chair is in, this panel that I cut out is going to be rectangular shape. So it's just gonna be length and width. Pay no attention to the shape. That's cut in after we cut off all the excess. We need enough material to wrap around and be able to pull this tight. So don't worry about the shape of the chair at this point. So I'm going to hold this down here. I have two inches extra here and I'll have two, two inches extra down here. And that is 32 inches. So this is 32 inches. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna measure the lengths of all my panels, length from top to bottom here, length from top to bottom here, length from top to bottom here. And then I'm gonna add all those lengths up and divide by 36. And that's gonna tell me how many yards I need to cover the front of my chair. Now I always round up to the nearest yard. And if you're using a uh, fabric that has a pattern on it, you're gonna wanna add extra yards and you're gonna wanna know what the size of the pattern repeat is to determine how many extra yards you'll need. You're gonna need to know where you want the pattern placed on the material, where it separates, where the seed, is. like there's a lot of math involved in pattern matching. So you wanna make sure that you have enough extra material to be able to accommodate as you work through because you're gonna cut this piece off and then you're gonna have to move further down the fabric to find a part of the pattern that's going to match seamlessly with this. So there's a lot of material wastage in pattern uh, matching. What's up, Thomas? Let's hear it. So, do I need a sturdy sewing machine or can I mostly just start with a good staple gun? So, you don't, that's a really great question. You don't need a sewing machine. If you're happy to hand sew, then you can hand sew. Really, all you need to get started doing upholstery is a pair of scissors, something to remove staples, which could be a flathead screwdriver if you want to, um, and a pair of scissors, something to remove staples, and a needle and thread and then like whatever fabric and material, whatever that you use. What I will say is that those are very manual tools and those make the job take longer and they have a harder, like an actual harder impact on your body. So the manual staplers have like, there's like a resistance to them. So it's kind of like crunching those like knuckle weights or whatever all the time. Uh, and it really can like build up uh, achy joints, uh, uh, carpal tunnel, arthritis, things of that nature. So it's fine to get started with that, but you want to move on to optimize tools right away. A pneumatic stapler is your best bet. You can use electric, but you can't adjust the pressure on electric. I don't know that electric comes with a long nose on it, so there'll be times where you run into problems because you need a long nose stapler and you don't have one. So I suggest if you're gonna get a stapler, you get a pneumatic stapler with a long nose. Harbor Freight has a two-in-one stapler slash uh, brad nailer, and you will use a brad nailer throughout your upholstery career, 20 bucks. But those staples are bigger, thicker, and they cost more money. You can get an $80 to $100 long nose stapler on Amazon, and the staples themselves, you can get $20,000 for like $10. Bucks. Like, it's, it's, worth, it's worth the investment. It's a one-time investment yeah. to save money every day after that investment. You're saving a ton of money. The yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so we got 32 inches in the back, and then I'm going to measure the same on the arm here. I'm holding it at 2 inches here. And then I'm going to run it through the pull through spot in the back. And then I'm measuring for two inches underneath. So this I've got, I'm clocking at 20 inches. So I have 32 inches here, 20 inches uh, for each arm. Now I know I can get both of these arms out of the width because they're so short. So I'm only gonna count that 20 inches. I'm not gonna count it as 40. So 32, 20, and now I need to measure the length from the longest point of this chair, which is from the center back all the way to the front and then around underneath this frame. It needs to be able to come around underneath the frame on both sides. And the reason why I measure from the front is because it's a rounded seat and it's narrower on these sides. So I wanna make sure it's long enough to cover the longest point. So I'm gonna put my ruler in here, hold it at two inches over where I need it on the back side, come around to the front, and I've got 32 inches there too. So 32 plus 32, 64, plus 20 is 84 divided by 36. Math, 84 divided by 36.
sharing a free download later this week. We talked about at her last retreat that helps with measuring layout and how much to add on the She's so freaking helpful. Madam of Making is incredible. Uh, she has a lot of really good advice. She met with us at one of my retreats as my special guest and then shared a list of books that were really helpful. I think Spruce was one of my favorites that she recommended. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Thank you for putting that in there. What is it? 84 divided by 36. Uh, 2.3 yards. So 2.3 yards is over two yards. I'm going to round up all the way to three yards. That's how much material I'm going to need to cover the front of this chair. Now that, of course, is not the truth. I like overestimated everything. I probably would be fine with two yards if I was very conservative. But if I'm new, I want to make sure that I have enough material to get me through to the next step. <clears throat> you can also conserve material by uh, having, uh, after the seam right here in the crack, you can sew on like a little pull piece and pull that through as a different fabric. When you tear apart furniture, oftentimes you'll see something like that. All right, Thomas, I'm going to have you move the Instagram camera so that they can see a little bit better this way now. Okay. And then I'm going to move all of that to in front of this table because we're going to get the fabric ready. Okay. We're talking just take the one down from here. Yep, and then put it on the tripod. So Ms. Birch has another question for you. Okay. She asked, does this measuring process apply or translate to making a slip cover as well? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You're, you are going to want to account for seam allowances, but if you're just like wrapping it around and figuring that out, that's a pretty good estimation if you're being generous on your measurements. But with a slip cover, you have seam allowances. So everywhere where there's going to be a seam, you're looking at adding at least one inch. So keep that in mind when you do that. You can measure the whole distance, and then everywhere you see a seam, you can just uh, add that many inches to the to the measurement of your project. Thank you so much, Thomas. Oh, You're the best. Uh, someone else think it's uh, city. No, hold on, something to cat. I want to get usernames correct. <laughs> uh, cute to cat. Uh, made a comment about sale rate also being great for supplies. Uh, sale rate is fantastic for supplies, and they have this uh, blue. It's this color blue industrial sewing machine that is a, in a travel case that I desperately want to get. And they also do like upholstery meetups every year. So you can go, and I think that's with Kim's Upholstery. So you should follow Kim's Upholstery too. So you can go and get tours of that shop. They're really great uh, United States based um, uh, upholstery supply supplier. And they have fantastic tutorials that are free to watch on there too. So I've already cut some panels, and I'm going to show you guys a bit of a conundrum that I had. So uh, all the fabric that I ordered didn't come in on time, so we're making concessions, and I got a different fabric for the front because I figured it could buy me time until the back got here if the back got here in time. So this was not my chosen uh, fabric. I wanted like a, a pea green color originally, but this actually works really well. I spent the entire day yesterday going to three different towns within a 45 mile radius looking for the right fabric and I couldn't find it. I found this on the discount rack at um, Joanne Fabrics and it was folded and it was put on a roll. And if you've ever used velvet, you know that that is like a killer of velvet because creases in velvet can be permanent. Velvet is a very finicky fabric and this uh, fabric has creases all over it. There was not one square foot of fabric that didn't have the creases in it. So I have to iron out these pieces, which if you have velvet and you have creases and you're trying to iron them out, find a test piece of velvet to work on first because 90% of the time you're gonna ruin your velvet. I got very lucky when I tested this yesterday and it actually didn't ruin my velvet. So I'm pretty happy that it's clearing it up. So I've already cut these panels for this chair. Now, when you're cutting velvet, and we'll do some cutting in the velvet um, later on, but I knew we were going to be taking time getting into this, so I wanted to be able to jump into putting fabric on as soon as possible. So I already cut these panels out for the whole chair, and I'll tell you which ones we got. This panel right here is for the back of the chair. Let me turn this around so you guys can see. So this panel is for the back of the chair. And then I have this panel that I have yet to cut in half, that I will cut in half, that is going on the arms of the chair here. And then I have this panel that is going on the seat of the chair. But we're going to make the seat a box cushion. So we are going to be sewing this panel to the side of the chair. 
So these are the panels that we're working with, and we're going to iron them out one at a time, and I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna just like shock you, all of you, with how incredible this works. Um, I was ready to cry. I was so friggin' sad. This is also a really good time to trim your nails. Your nails can scratch velvet and it can make it permanent. I'm going to actually do that real quick because I have, I broke two nails yesterday testing this. So I'm just going to trim the length off of that. We got any questions, Thomas? Yeah. Will I do this? <laughs> That's what we're getting ready to cover right now. That's a, yeah, so velvet, uh, I, I once made a pros and cons list about velvet and the only thing on the pros list was it looks cool and it feels cool. End of list. Uh, it's really finicky. It has its own direction in nap, so if you put it together in a different way, it will look like two different colors. So I'll show you. When you put a piece of velvet on a piece of furniture, you want the nap to brush down. So you want it to go light and brush down when you wipe down. The reason for that is, is if it were opposite and when you sit on the back of a chair, when you slide down into a chair, it slides that nap down and it pulls it against the grain that it's supposed to go. And after a very few times using it, it will actually ruin the velvet. So you want to make sure when you're putting velvet on that the nap goes down. And that being said, <coughs> if you put the naps together in two different directions, they can appear to be two different colors. So I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, there you go, color change on the screen. But this is an example of velvet going together in two different directions. So this is the same velvet. It's just when you change the direction of the nap, it looks like it's a completely different color. So I need to start ironing this. This is a really clear example of uh, how to ruin velvet. So when you have velvet on your person and you're not using it, it should be getting rolled up. If, uh, if you can't roll it up on a tube, you should roll it up very gingerly in its own fashion and then set it horizontally somewhere and don't put anything on top of it. They're very, very fragile. So this was folded in half and it was wrapped on a bolt. So it's got creases every which way. We got anything else? So let's see, there was one. Um, Kermios Graffi was asking about, well, they said, the fa that fabric is beautiful. What are you making? Uh, so I looked at the Yes, yeah, thank you for yeah. the compliments on the fabric. Uh, this is the chair that we're working on today. We actually have two of these. So if we get the front of this upholstered, we're going to uh, reupholster the second one too. So this chair I'm working on is a dining set. It's got a floral back velvet that goes on it that has peonies and peacock feathers on it. And then this is the velvet for the front. This is a performance velvet. I'm pretty impressed with it so far. Uh, it can take a beating, it can get wet and it can steam. Thomas, can I get you to give me some water to put in this? Absolutely. E either in a cup, but there was a bottle. There might be a bottle in the um, textiles area, okay. like where the iron goes that you fill with water and then you pour it in there. Okay, let me see. I'll be right back. So um, I'm doing this clearly on the back of the fabric because I don't want to melt the front. I do have this set to linen. This is a really, uh, uh, high pile velvet. I'm so shocked that this works. I'm, I honestly cannot even believe that it works. I even did it to the front of the velvet and it didn't ruin it, but we're not going to be doing that here today. So I have got this in steam mode and I'm almost out of water, but I'm going to get started and I'm just going over these wrinkly areas. I'm going to go over the whole thing because it does like uh, push everything down in one direction. I want to do that consistently, but it pushes it down in the direction of the nap. So I'm going to get these cameras down closer so you can see, so you can watch as we do this. Okay. There you are. Thanks, Thomas. You're welcome. All right. That looks good. Let's pull this one. Can everybody hear me okay? Because Thomas let me borrow this freaking microphone, <laughs> and I'm so excited about it because I think that... Uh, I think from the video that I made earlier, it sounds like it did really good. I'm not sure. Okay, I'm gonna put some water in my iron real quick. So not on top of my fabric. 
reading off some comments from chat. Um, let's see. Regan says, hello, friends. And that visual of the different directions, like, very amazed with that. Oh, fun. The velvet. Uh, we've got Bianca, who says, my dad had his own upholstery shop for about 40 years. Love this. I never paid attention to how he did anything, but now I have stuff I need reupholstered. <laughs> it's probably in your blood. <laughs> yeah, okay. it's a little bit like riding a bike. As soon as you, all, all your evolution and genealogy will kick in right at the right moment, I promise. Uh, upholstery is a really fun thing to learn. I tell everybody if you can learn how to read a recipe, that you can learn upholstery. Because just, it's just a step-by-step -step process. And the skill comes with practice. So you're not going to do your first chair and have it look like incredible and amazing. Uh, that being said, all of my students' projects look incredible and amazing. <laughs> so you should take my classes. Um, but it is like with practice, you can get good at anything. And I really wanted to be good at this. So that's what I've been doing. And I learn something new every day. So I'm just pumping this full of steam at this point. And these, this is a pretty bad wrinkles. I don't know if you can see well on the front here. I'm going to try to avoid getting the stuff too wet. But these are really kind of nasty wrinkles at the top here and really difficult to remove. So that's what we're trying to do is remove those so that you can't see them on the front. And I'm, going, I'm not going in any direction in particular because I didn't notice uh, a change when I did that. On the back, you can see these wrinkles are already starting to come out. And then when I flip over to the front, you can see they're starting to disappear there as well. Oh my god, you can see it on camera. <laughs> I was very scared. <laughs> I only practiced this once last night, and I'm like, does it look like it went away? Okay, it did go away. Um, so, yeah, so I got very lucky with this fabric because I thought I was going to have to start late today and go on another journey to find a good fabric for this. I, this project is really important to me because I'm making a dining room table. Um, I've been working on these conceptual dining room tables, uh, using the CNC shop bot at my local makerspace, MakerWorks here, um, to carve designs into tables that look great with a leaf, and then they just extend the design. Uh, they look great without a leaf, and then the design extends when you put a leaf in the middle. And then this, these six chairs are actually going to be going with this. I have two captain's chairs and two uh, or four regular chairs. So I want to get as many of these wrinkles out as possible. I do also think that I will be able to steam this after I get it attached to the chair and uh, if there's any additional wrinkles in there. But I'm, I have a different steamer for that. I wouldn't use this iron. But we'll do some testing before we implement any crazy actions like that. Do we have any questions? Yes. Oh, this is a sunbeam iron. It's not that fancy, but what I will say is it's very heavy. And I've noticed that like just any old iron doesn't work for upholstery. You need something very heavy. You need something that has weight. Uh, my iron that I had before, and I don't know where it is, I've lost it since I've moved, yeah. is a shark. And it's really heavy and it's really good. And I've had it for eight years and I've never had a problem with it. So I highly recommend shark irons. This Sunbeam is great too, and I know Sunbeam is like a cheap brand. And I've been at this shop for over a year now, and this has been the iron that's been kicking around here. So I know that these are probably around 20 bucks or less. Yeah, so we'll I don't, yeah, yeah, I don't think it's a very expensive, but you can find heavy antique irons at the thrift store all the time. And they, you can usually test them there too. So this little, areas giving me trouble so now we're going to figure out what direction this is in we still have a couple of lines in the middle i want to get rid of here so when i rub the fabric in this direction it's rubbing the nap up when i rub it in this direction it's rubbing the nap down and that's the direction i want to put it in so this is the top of or the back of my seat this is going on the seat let's move these Let me test that again, I already forgot. Down, this is matted, this is wiping down. 
So this will be the back of my seat and the front of my seat because we sit in it in this direction. Go ahead, Thomas. So, okay, so we've got a, we've got a little bit of a uh, joke comment. Uh, it says, I promise to hire you as my poster instructor and be very myself and get him out of the way. <laughs> my husband would have a huge problem with that, I think. Yeah, I, I think he, <laughs> he might not be okay with that. All right. Not to mention, I have adult children of my own, so probably a little out of the age range. Okay, hold on. I'm going to answer that question. And then we have a, another point after that. Okay. I, I okay, was it Jessica Crane wants Jessica to know? Crane, yes. Jessica Crane wants to know where I'm located and when I offer my classes. Yes. So uh, I teach my classes out of my local maker space, MakerWorks, here in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I teach my classes, my in-person classes, four days a week on Friday evenings from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m., Saturday mornings from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., Sunday mornings from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., and Monday mornings 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. So even if you're not from the area but you want to travel here, you can take a four-class package and get a whole weekend. Uh, all my classes are buy three, get one free. So you would pay for three of those classes, get one free, and it's 225 bucks for like your own built-in weekend upholstery camp. It's only three hours a day, but you get a lot out of those three hours when you take all of your classes consecutively. So when you take my classes, you tend to need more than one class to finish a project. So you'll bring in a piece, and the first day is usually stripping and measuring and evaluating. But if you've gotten all of that stuff done and you come with a cleared out frame, we're just going to get you started from the first step, which is putting on your infrastructure, then putting on your foam, then putting on your batting, then putting on your fabric. We do pattern making. We do uh, sewing with an industrial sewing machine, deep button tufting, piping, channeling, like anything you can think of we can handle here in class. So you can come in person to take those classes or I have virtual upholstery workshops. Right now I have Monday nights scheduled six to nine and that's open to up to six students. So you can come to that class, bring your project. We do it via Zoom and I have a telehealth cart here at this makerspace that I use. Uh, it's funny, but it has 4K video, which when you're watching a Zoom, I know we've all went through this Zoom phase, Zoom videos are garbage when you're taking them from your laptop. But I use a 4K telehealth video to videotape. Uh, also, you're getting multiple angles. Uh, me talking to you, whatever my hands are doing at the time, and then helping you through your project. So there's a lot you can get out of virtual upholstery workshops, too. Right. OK, we got more? Uh, yes. So um, Anthony Devine uh, says, just, just <laughs> Yeah, no, no. So Anthony Devine is coming in a little late here, but I think he's just sharing some of his knowledge because he himself is an upholstery teacher over in the UK. He is on the show, it was the show Money for Nothing as one of the local upholsterers there who would take on their projects. Have you ever seen that show? No, I haven't. Uh, the host actually goes to the dump, which they call the tip, and intercepts people throwing their furniture away in the trash. And then she takes it to local craftspeople and has them reimagine it or reupholster it or restore it and then uh, sells it and then gives the profit back to the person who is throwing that stuff. So Anthony Devine is uh, one of the great people of that show. Okay. Yeah, he's really cool. Uh, and I appreciate you being here. This is really cool. I really uh, am excited that you guys are joining. If you're here and you're learning something, I know we're getting through a lot of questions, which is learning, but I know you guys came to see what it is that I have here to do today, so we're going to get to that too. But when I remind you, if you're here, if you can just tap the screen violently when I remind you for as long as you can possibly stand, when you do that, you're engaging with my content. It's sending it out through the feeds. It's sending it out through the For You pages. And it's telling people who I am, what I do, and it helps them find me so that I can continue to do my business. And you guys can single-handedly help save the upholstery industry by driving people to this feed. So that's what it is that we're trying to do here. So the fabric that I have here is for the C. I'm done ironing it for now, but after I cut it into the pattern, I am probably going to uh, I am probably going to iron it some more based on what is visible. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to place the fabric 
on the material so that or on the chair so that I can get a visual for what it's going to look like. I am going to sew a box cushion for this seat because my fabric, uh, how wide it was, really went into that one crease in the middle and I wasn't 100% sure I would be able to get it out, but I knew I could hide it in the sides. So I am going to sew the box cushion so that I can avoid any, any potential wrinkles being visible as possible. So I'm gonna place the material on the seat. I'm going to spread it out. I'm gonna show you guys how to make that pattern. We're gonna do that with paper first. And then I'm gonna bring it to the table put the pattern on the fabric, draw it in, cut it out and put it back on here and then show you the steps to like sewing the front box panel onto that too. So I'm gonna go get my paper real quick. So I don't need as much of this material as the fabric that's on my chair. So I am going to remeasure the seat of my chair so that I have enough of this paper to just cover the surface of the top. So pull this fabric off. Also, you should mark your fabric. You should mark your fabric in the direction that it goes. So wiping down, it softens it. Wiping up, it disturbs the nap. So this is the back of my seat. I'm just gonna write a B there lightly so that I know that that's what that is. And then I'm gonna move it out of the way. So I need my ruler that I know I just had. No drinking games with me, people. Don't pay attention to my scissors, don't pay attention to my Sharpie, and don't pay attention to where my ruler goes because I never know. So I'm going to measure the depth of the seat from the front to the back, and I'm just gonna make that uh, measurement on here two inches bigger than that. So I have 18, so that's gonna be 20 inches. I'm gonna write that on here. And then I'm gonna measure the width from the widest part in the front of my chair. And the reason why I wanna do that is because it's narrower in the back and I wanna make sure I have enough to cover. I'm gonna add two inches to that measurement so that it goes over either way too. I got 26, so I'm gonna put by 28 inches. Now this is basically just a rectangle. If I wanted, I could measure this from edge to edge add a half inch seam allowance and then go back. But I want to show you guys when you have a mist, like a crazy shaped seat, how you can make your own pattern for the top of it so that your box cushion is fit to tailor it. So I'm gonna show you kind of both ways. So here, I'm gonna cut this out of the table, but we're gonna take this over to the cutting table. Thomas, can I get your help with that? Of course. Thanks. Also, Regan says your coffee should be added to the list of things that move around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Regan knows this because she takes my classes and I uh, am constantly putting my coffee on everybody's table. All right, which, uh, camera so I'm going to the cutting table here. Okay. So right where we um, had it before so that you can see. Okay. And we're just going to be cutting some paper. Both cameras? Yeah, both cameras. Right. And maybe one camera. Instagram can be here. More. Uh, yeah, right there. And then let's point it kind of down at the table like more okay. area. I don't know if we can do that. We're going to have to do it. Hi, guys. Almost might have to do it, <laughs> yeah, this way. Okay. Yeah. So if you're watching from both channels, you're now getting two different angles. Oh, I'm going to be up here in this corner. It's OK. Nah. You're now getting two different angles to see how we measure this. OK. So I need to make this paper 20 by 28 roughly. It just needs to cover the whole top. of my chair. So here's a here's a question here, Kim. Uh, mm -hmm. from Chrissy. Uh, saying thank you so much. Will we be able to access this video at a later time? Uh, I'm at work and don't want to miss out on it. So on Instagram, uh, it will get posted there. You'll be able to watch the full length. Um, on TikTok, I chop up the video and I use it for content later on down the road. But if you are in my local upholstery group on Facebook, you'll get to watch a lot more from that content. And you can ask questions and post uh, your own uh, projects while you're in there too. So you get a lot more out of it than just one video. What I will say is I'm here every Tuesday. 
So you can always watch me every Tuesday. Now the width of this is like 48 inches long. So I know I can get my 28 inch out of there. And that's what I want to do because I want to conserve material and I'm only going to measure 20 inches down here. I always use a T-square, assuming this is a factory straight edge, which it's not, and that's fine. I don't need it to be exact. I'm going to measure down 20 inches here. If you have a T-square like this, you have to be mindful that one side starts with a 1 and one side starts with a 48. And you have to know which side you're measuring from because you will get confused all the time. So I'm just measuring 20 inches from the center here. And I'm going to measure 20 inches on this long end and then I'm going to do the same thing on this end and then I can use my t-square to connect these dots so that I can cut this out. I don't even need that whole line. So now I'm just going to measure 28 inches up from this edge I'm 28 inches up from this edge. And the reason why it's good to use a T-square is because if you're measuring and this ruler is tipped in this way or this way in any direction, it compounds your measurement. It's not the same measurement. So T-squares help you to keep those lines square. So now I'm just going to connect these two dots and then I can cut this out and put it on my seam. I'm going to use a different method to make my pattern, but I'm showing you two here so that you know. I got to get a different pair of scissors. I have a handful of scissors here in my shop. The black and black scissors are fabric scissors. Anything else is garbage scissors, and they usually have glue and batting all over them, so they can be easy to find. You don't want to use your fabric scissors even to cut paper because they won't last long with fabric scissors that way. Okay. Now, Thomas, can I get your help moving everything over here? Oh my God. It's like on the left side like that? Yeah, uh, maybe as far back as where your camera is right now. Okay. Maybe put it right there. Yeah, we should just use those spots. I think those are okay. those three spots. <laughs> I think those are going to be great. Cool. Okay, so now I have my piece of paper. So this is great for when you're making your own pattern and your seat is not a square or rectangle. Now this actually is just a rectangle. When I make my measurements and just making the rectangular measurements, and then I'm just going to make it longer in the back so it goes through. But sometimes you have cushions that are not rectangular. So first I want to put my straight edge on the front of the cushion here. And then I'm just going to push this paper back. I want to keep it aligned with the straight edge as much as possible. You could even pin it down. That's not a bad idea. Let me get a couple of pins. Let's lead by example, Thomas. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> that was for you, yeah. <laughs> so I'm putting this down, and I'm stretching this across as I go because I want it to. I'm going to maybe change the direction of that pen because I want to make sure that this is as fitting as possible. Good question. Uh, I take my scissors to a sharpener. There's a guy who comes to the Joy and Fabrics out these ways once a week, and you can drop all your scissors off to him and pick them up at the end of the day for 10 bucks a pair to have them sharpened, which is really cool. So if you're making your pattern in this fashion, which is arguably the sloppiest fashion you can make a pattern uh, in any sense of the word, but it's all going to work out in the end, let me show you. But this is a really good way, like especially if you're a beginner, to grasp the concept of what that pattern has to look like. So I've just got a rectangular piece of fabric, and now I've got to make my cuts to get this material to go through the chair so that uh, I can see exactly what size it needs to be, and I can trace it appropriately on the paper, and so the paper lays nice and flat. So I'm going to get my scissors, 
And I'm gonna get a Sharpie and show you guys how I do that. So the cool thing is, is this is also like your first practice layer of fabric. Uh, you're gonna practice the same cuts on this as you are going to do with your fabric and any material that you put on here. Um, so this is a really great way to sort of practice doing that. And if you make a mistake, it's fine because nobody's gonna see it. So I need to cut so that all of this paper can fit through the pull through spots. And there are barriers here. This arm has a piece of wood this thick. This arm has a piece of wood this thick. There's two legs in the back that this material has to go around. So I need to make cuts so that that material can clear all of those barriers and come out smoothly on the other side. So that's what I'm gonna do. Now the first cut, and I don't know if you can see on Instagram, here is my pull through spot. So I need this paper to come through this hole very cleanly. And if you guys are on this side, this is the hole I'm talking about right here. This is where I'm making my cut. So I'm gonna make a cut that comes for this edge of this and uh, make a cut that comes for that edge so that it can clear that pull through spot. So on this side, so you guys can see, my cuts on this side is gonna go straight for the middle of this leg, and then it's gonna veer off to each edge of that leg, these sides, so that this piece of material can come through this side, and this piece of material can come over on that side. So the way we do that is by making what's called a Y cut, and you're gonna see why that's called a Y cut. So I know, and I can feel inside here with my fingers to where the edge of that barrier is, and I know the other edge is right here in front of the arm, I need a line that goes straight to the middle of that barrier. So if you're using chalk or a Sharpie here, be careful if you're using a Sharpie. You just want that line to go straight to the middle of that barrier. Now I use two fingers here and that's because I have two fingers on me at all time. You can use any arbitrary measurement that you want but it has to be a little bit away from the chair. So two finger widths away, I make a little dot. From that dot, I draw a line to the very edge, outer edge of this barrier. Now I don't want this line to come to the outside edge of this barrier because then there's going to be a gap between the material and the foam here. I just want it to come just inside of it and I would say like a sixteenth of an inch. And then I'm going to make another dot or another line from that dot to the other side of that barrier and you'll see here I've made the letter Y. That is why it's called a Y cut. And the reason why we make a cut like that, I'm almost ready for you Thomas, is uh, it allows the fabric to go around the barrier and meet itself on the other side. But it also, if it doesn't need to meet itself, it also gives you extra material on this side to fold and clean up along that edge. So if this were your show fabric, that would be cleaning up right along that edge. So I wanna make, this looks like battling this front edge is gonna be difficult. So I'm gonna pull that a little over and we'll just cut it to fit. I'm gonna do this both ways and then we can see how <laughs> accurate these end up becoming. So now we have this little piece of a Y and this actually, when it's um, fabric, it's gonna get stuffed down in between the foam and the arm there. But when it's this piece, it's just gonna come right up to the side. So now this piece is free to go down there, almost. I still have to make cuts to the back legs. Now the back legs are at an angle. Right here they're angled this way. So instead of coming to the face of it this way, it's actually on an angle. So we wanna fold the material. If it were fabric, we'd be folding fabric, but it's paper. We're gonna fold that along the edge of the angle of that leg. What do we got, Thomas? Uh, so I'm um, sorry, I'm trying, to, I'm trying not to interrupt you, but at the same time- Can you read from there? A little bit. <laughs> there is a comment from Mr. Divine um, who suggests a collaborative online class in the future. Oh, that would so, be fun. Yeah, I was, I was trying to sit there like, uh, Kim, uh, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> We definitely are going to have to take this offline for sure. Okay, so I am going to, um, I am going to make the same cut over here on this side. I'm folding that material down. You'll see it's kind of tucked into the foam a little bit here. If you were doing this with fabric, if you pre-tuck it into the foam, you're not gonna overcut it. So I'm going to make that line straight for the center of that barrier, two finger widths away. I'm going to make a line for one edge of that arm and then another line for just the inside edge of that arm. And then I'm going to cut straight down and make that Y. I'm cutting it like right about up to the foam. 
so that this material can come around the arm that way and this material can tuck back. So now we're going to be doing, oh, Instagram couldn't even see that one. That's fun. Uh, <laughs> so now we're going to be doing cuts in the back here. And I'll move TikTok a little closer to for this visual. If you guys are just here joining us and you're having a good time, um, all I ask is that you tap on the screen violently from time to time uh, to help engage with my content so it can get sent out to other people and people can find me. TikTok will give you prizes if you do that. So, <laughs> or not, you know, physical prizes, but uh, it throws parties for you. So I'm going to be sort of doggy earing this material back against the angle of that leg in the back. And I want to make the same cut for that leg. It's going to go straight to the center of the leg and then V out into the corners. And you guys are going to get to see me do this cut a bajillion times today. Because like every layer I put on, I have to cut around these barriers. So now this Y cut's done. This material can tuck in here. And all of this can tuck into the arm. Now I want to be careful not to like muck up this paper or get it stuck, but it doesn't go through very well. Probably on the other side, that was just a dumb idea. I'm going to remove a lot of this. It doesn't need to even be there. I just need it to tuck slightly back. I don't need it to go through the whole frame. So I've already messed this up and I would suggest at this phase you would just replace this material, but I'm not going to be using this as my pattern. I'm just showing you how to do it. So I want to make the same cut over here. The Y cut for the back leg. I'm going to cut a lot of this off because I don't need it. And then I'm going to smooth this down into the frame. So this is a really great way to make a pattern for your seat cushion. If your pattern is like a weird shape, not a square. I can make this one as a rectangle. So up here in the front, I'm automatically folding this back, folding that back. I'm going to take a pair of scissors to the front edge of this chair to trim it up with the front edge to mark the front of my pattern. So that's first. Now I'm just running my scissors flush with the front. I also add a layer of uh, half inch thick cotton batting to the top of this cushion before I go, which I do not account for when I'm making my pattern because I want to make sure that my pattern looks nice and full. But I do make it a half inch bigger than the pattern that I'm cutting out. So you'll even notice that this is not like a straight line here in the front, but we are going to uh, one fourth symmetry with this and we're going to make sure that that line is straight when we go to do the pattern. I'm measuring this as a rectangle, but I can show you how to do that. So I'm gonna do the same thing and trim these sides so that that is exactly as wide as it needs to be. And then I'm gonna take my Sharpie and I'm gonna run my Sharpie along the inside edge, just like this, to mark where the pattern goes on the front. Now it's important that you keep your Sharpie straight up and down. Don't poke your Sharpie into that ditch and try and draw it from there because it actually, uh, your cushion is going to set like on the inside here. And this is if you're making a box cushion. All of my pieces are gonna stay long here, but if I was making a box cushion and needed this pattern, you just wanna run your Sharpie straight up and down. So this is gonna look like kinda hell at first, but then you can clean it up, you can edit it in post. Right, Thomas? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> And then I'm gonna do the same thing to the fronts of the arms, because if it was a removable cushion, you would have to do that too. But I'm not going to actually be sewing that um, for my purposes. So this is my pattern, and I'm gonna take it over to the cutting table. You wanna help me with those cameras, Thomas? Oh, balls. Oh, I appreciate that. Thomas is the best. This is going so well. 
Cool. Yeah. Hey, man, I want to do this for you, too. Yeah. This is really cool. And it's, we'll figure it out. it's making a huge difference. Okay, so now I have my pattern. I'm going to cut out with scissors all the way. So remember, this is for if you're making a box cushion. You're going to want this pattern. I kind of cut just outside those lines because I know I'm going to have to fold this in half to force symmetry. And I want to go with whatever bigger measurement it is that I have. So I'm smoothing out the lines myself too when I cut so that it's not as crazy looking. And then my next step would be to fold this in half. I want to fold it in half because I need this to be the same exact size on both sides. And I can already see here the difference uh, where it didn't meet up. So I would need to make sure when I go to put this on a pattern, like I'm going to remake this in paper, trace it again, cut it out so that everything is symmetrical and then put that pattern on fabric and cut it out and use it. That's how I would make this pattern. But we're going to make my pattern a little bit differently. Now we're going to go back to the chair, Thomas, yep. and I'm going to be in front of the chair. So despite the shape of this chair being round in the back and square in the front, the piece of material that I need to cut out to sew to put on it is just a rectangle. It's a rectangle in the front and then I make my cuts in that rectangle around my leg and it's able to tuck in through the seat. So this is not that complicated of a piece. So we're going to measure to cut this top panel and then we're going to measure for the side panel and then the side panels that go here. So I need one piece of fabric that goes on the top here and then I need another panel that sews on the sides. I will not be putting welt on this because I'm going to be using decorative welt along the outside edges of this and I don't want my white welt to break up the seat in any way. So I'm not going to use welt for the seat. I wanted it to be a wrap and staple, but the wrinkles in the fabric made that impossible. So now we're working with what we got. So I'm going to measure the width of the front of the seat. That's going to be the entire width of the rectangle that goes on top of this. And I just need to sew my panel to the front of that rectangle. I'm going to measure this, but I'm going to measure it down here at the wood where the hard edges are because I want it to be able to squish to fit that exact shape. So I'm going to measure from one edge of the wood leg outside edge to the other outside edge of the wood leg, which is 25 inches. Now, in order for me to be able to sew that, I need to add a seam allowance, which needs a half inch on either side. So I need to be able to sew that fabric together at 25 inches for it to fit. So if I have a 25 inch measurement here, then I'm going to need to move that up one inch, a half inch for either side to account for that seam allowance. So we're looking at 26 inches wide by, we're gonna run this through to the back of our chair. It staples to the back on top. So I'm starting that at like two inch mark. And then it comes around to the front here. And this is 23 inches. Now I know the material that I have is longer than that, but I need it to be at least 23 inches. So let's grab the piece we were working with. By the way, just promise not to tell me if any of these aren't splattered. Oh, okay, that's fine. <laughs> I appreciate the effort. I, uh, I'm not complaining about free photography here. Okay, what do we got? Now I have to find the fabric. I put a B on it. B, there it is. So this is the fabric that we picked. It's already got to be ironed again. You can see this is where my fingernails touched it. So velvet is a very finicky beast. So I need this fabric. If it wipes down from back to front here, I need it to be 26 inches wide. And then I'm going to just keep whatever length it is. So I'm going to measure 26 inches on the best part of this fabric so that this smooth part is what's actually on top and then uh, the rest goes in the back. And before I sew everything together, I'm actually gonna sew that. So let's go to the cutting table, Thomas.
garbage. I have this marked. This is the back, which means it wipes down this way. And I need to measure 26 inches wide. That looks good. And now I can wear glasses. So 26 inches wide, I'm, I've already pre-marked this edge down here as the square edge, I squared it up. I'm just going to measure 26 inches from that measurement, aligning my T-square, and then make a line down here. Look, it's just inside that line, I'm so excited. Ah, oh, nerve wracking. I'm gonna do the same 26 inch measurement up here. Oh no. Yeah, 26 inches wide. <laughs> I get confused by math very easily. And then, uh, so a professional will tell you you should use chalk and you should definitely do this on the back of your fabric. Thomas. Sorry. No, <laughs> it's not, you're apologizing. You're apologizing because I'm doing it wrong. That's hilarious. Everyone's supposed to chastise me in the comment section, please. Okay, so I'm gonna cut this to width. And now I need to cut the panels for the front. And I have the same problem of there being a crease in the dead center of where this is on the panel. So I need to cut a panel that will fit the width of this and then two separate panels that'll cut the sides. So let me cut off this squared edge. And then before we sew it together, I'm gonna to iron it again because I think we can do better. So these are my scraps. I don't need those. When you're cutting to custom tailor fit a cushion to a seat, your measurements have to be precise. If they're not precise, it's not gonna fit well. So it's gonna be the exact measurement of the cushion plus uh, the account of a half inch added seam allowance on any side that gets a seam. So on this cushion, there's a seam on this side and a seam on this side, it gets an inch. There's only one seam on this side, so it only gets a half inch. So that's how we would determine that. So now I need a panel that goes this way. My front panel is going to be the exact same width as this panel, and that is 26 inches. And then we need to measure the chair to see what the side panel is. If you wanna turn these cameras just first, they can stay there. Just yeah, just turn them so that they can see me, I think. directed at me or at you but someone said my fashion professor oh, oh per no that's perfect right okay. there, fine. my fashion uh, professor fashion design was yeah yeah I yeah directed at me for my camera work no or? it's for me for how uh, i am marking on fabric with oh. sharpie oh, on okay. the face of the fabric with sharpie listen i'm an adult and an american <laughs> which means i can do well, apparently whatever the fuck i want uh no that's a gross joke that's not funny okay so i'm going to measure i need uh, my second panels are the width of this on both sides so i'm going to measure that which is seven inches this i can make it longer because it's going to staple to the frame here so i'm going to do 10 inches on both of them to just make sure that i have enough so 10 inches this way, 10 inches this way, 26 inches in the front. And then I need to know the length from the top of the seat to the bottom. And it has to tuck underneath the chair to staple. And you also have to account for a half inch seam allowance on top. So I'm going to give myself a couple inches and say 10 inches from top to bottom is going to be enough to cover there. So 26 inches. And then what was this? 10? This way? I have no idea. You guys are, yeah, 10 inches, so that's an easy. So uh, 26 inches by 10 inches, and then two 10 inch squares. So this is the front of my seat. I'm gonna put on a chair so we don't forget. So um, Cutie Cat wants to know, any tips for accounting for that preciseness with a thicker material like leather? Uh, yeah, so knowing the thickness of the leather is important, and you can do that by um, getting some calipers. Same kind of calipers you use to measure wood or metal. You yep. can use to measure leather. Uh, metal calipers, I could describe them to you, but I don't own any. So, 
Uh, <laughs> but they are a good tool to have around and to know that. I will also say that leather and vinyl both have a stretch to them that a lot of other fabrics don't. So you do even want to accommodate for that because with leather and vinyl, you want it to be a nice, snug, stretched fit. Uh, whereas with fabric, if you do that, when you sit on it, it'll tear away from the staples and it's not great. So it might surprise you that I've already cut this fabric into 10 inch widths. Can we see the whole table on both cameras? Cause I don't think it's pointed. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, rotate. There we go. And then same here. Let's go over this way. Okay, so I'm gonna cut the salvage edge off of this fabric because we don't need that. Do we have any other questions, Thomas? Or are we good? We'll cut up. Uh, let me see. I am taking a look. It looks like we're, we're doing pretty good. Good. So this fabric actually has a lot of defects in it. There's some like white spots here, which like the ink that dyed the fabric never even hit. We have the center crease here that we need to avoid because I already know that that doesn't come out. And then we have these sides. So I need to get a good 26 inch panel out of this. And I need to know which direction it goes in. Oh, fantastic. So it wipes down in this direction. I need it to wipe down the same way as the seat so that it doesn't appear to be two different colors. This is already at 10 inches thick. I've already measured that. Now I just need to measure it at 10 inches wide and I need two measurements. Look at, I'm hoarding Sharpies now. So I'm just gonna do this right on the face of the fabric with a Sharpie, <laughs> with this velvet that I cannot get more of. It's the last of it. Okay, so 10 inches here, go ahead. Um, do, 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 do. I think, let's see. I think Anthony was signing off for a while. He says class soon. Um, and then, let's see, can, yeah. I, re I readjusted the camera. Thank you, folks. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Sorry. All right. Oh, these aren't yeah. 10 inches. Because that's not a square. I, I got to make sure this is long enough. It just occurred to me that I'm not looking at a square as so I'm I measuring am, it. I am paying attention to notifications. I'm seeing a lot of people following uh, and, and sharing. So I want right. to say thank you for, from both of us for that. Yes, thank you. And uh, Thomas, get your face in front of a screen. You can oh, yeah, stand yeah. right here behind me. You can see me behind here. Hi. So this Hello. is Thomas. He owns a business called Tusano Training Company, and uh, he's a woodworker. He makes a lot of gaming accessories, yes, yeah, uh, and cutting boards. You can take it away, Thomas. Tell him all about yourself. Uh, so I joined here at MakerWorks about two years ago. Uh, What's MakerWorks? Oh, MakerWorks is the shop that we're currently standing in. Uh, we're in the common room. Uh, but it is a 14,000 square foot in shared industrial space is the best way to put it. It's like a gym for craftspeople. Yeah. You pay a membership fee and you get and you get trained on specific tools and then you can use them to make whatever your heart desires within specific limitations. But uh, let's not get lost in the details. Right. You can't become a production facility here. Yeah. No high production. But you can. So I use it to teach my classes. Yep. I get to rent out this space to teach my classes four days a week. Mm -hmm. There's a full-fledged wood shop. Yes. CNC's in every room. Yeah, like pretty much. Like a CNC router in the wood shop, CNC plasma cutters, wood mills and lathes in the metal shop, yep. or sorry, metal mills and metal lathes in the metal shop. Plasma cutter. 3D cutters, plasma cutter, or 3D cutters, 3D printers, plasma cutters, laser cutters, uh, CNC embroidery machine, like all of these tools you have access to when you're a member. I don't know what other maker spaces do, but I know that the top tier membership at this particular ma maker space, which doesn't include storage, like just the yeah. annual membership is, uh, well, the monthly membership, if you just pay by the month, is $220 a month at the top tier level, yep. and that's keys to the shop. Yes. That's, that's like, you can come here, that, yeah. yeah, you can come here at three o'clock in the morning, which Thomas does all the time. We need yeah. to get a little sleep pod in here so that you people can <laughs> take naps. But, um, so that's top tier membership, but it's like 45 bucks is the lowest yeah. one for it. So you can access it you can pay day passes. You can uh, pay for the month. You can pay for credits so that you can come and use them as you go. Yep. A lot of maker spaces are set up like that. And so uh, we did, um, 
my upholstery retreats from here locally last year, mm -hmm. but we're taking them on the road this year. And we're hoping to boost maker spaces all over the United States because yeah. people don't understand what an incredible resource this is. I wouldn't be able to run my business if it wasn't I for this. Be able to so I'm looking forward to teaching some more classes from local maker spaces. If you have a maker space near you and you want to see some upholstery classes happen in there, you can actually send them to the link, like call, give them a call, tell me what upholstery classes send them to the link in my bio if you're the one that connects me to the makerspace and i come out there for a weekend this spring or summer then you'll get to take my weekend upholstery camp for free um, and we already have a diy cave in bend oregon is potentially signing up for two weekends one weekend for sure maybe two weekends in which i will also be teaching classes midweek through there too so if you're from the bend oregon area you can come out and hang out with us that day too so i have all my pattern pieces now. I want to measure the direction so that I know, and then I need to I need to iron them. So wipe down, wipe up. This is the top. I'm going to mark it with a T, and it's also the front, so I'm going to mark it with an F. These are my sides. Down, up. Okay, so top, side. I'm writing out that word, and then top side so I am going to now first sew these three items together and then sew these to the top of the box cushion uh, before we sew that though I gotta iron it so if you want to bring everybody over to this table thanks Thomas are we still hot here yes uh, oh hold on there's I just saw a comment I need to run over to how are we looking on, on camera two here? Is this good? Angle? Oh yeah, camera two looks good. Okay. Can you flip the camera around on that and then flip that around so that so I can, that can see, see them the see me? Yeah, because then I can, then I know who I'm talking to. Ooh, okay, hi Instagram, hi TikTok. Uh, I wish we were on Facebook today, but we had a device malfunction and we're down to two devices. If you're here watching either live on uh, Instagram or live on TikTok, Please share this link with your friends on Facebook. If you're here and you're in my Facebook private group, the Local Upholstery Club, share the link inside that group and let people know that I had a, a device malfunction for Facebook so we couldn't get on in time, but that you can see us here on Instagram and TikTok from two different angles. What's up? So, okay, so that was the thing. So from Anthony and Divine, that was supposed to read, how about we do a British American class soon? Yeah, so that would be fun. Anthony's really hammering this one home. He yeah. Yeah, I, so I would love to talk about that. I was I was following Anthony um, since uh, before. I don't even know if he was on the show yet, um, but I had followed him as an upholsterer when I first started getting into this because there were no um, there were no instructional videos for upholstery when I was teaching myself. There were videos of people doing upholstery, but they were not trying to show you how to do it. They were <laughs> they're not watch, like walking you through the process. So um, so that was that was like a frustrating experience to get through. Okay, so I'm gonna move this back. And then I'm just gonna work on ironing these pieces before I get to sewing them to make sure that they're as clean as they can be. Now it is important that these are cut precisely like as rectangles because of the way they sew together they have to fit a rectangle precisely i think maybe my thing turned itself off no oh. oh. but it's turning back on i just gotta wait for that to heat up so if you're just joining for the first time my name is kim and the classroom is falling apart as we speak uh, I teach upholstery workshops here out of my local makerspace, MakerWorks. I am working out of the all-purpose classroom slash conference room right now. I am able to rent this out a few days a week to teach my in-person classes, but I also off offer virtual upholstery workshops. So on Monday nights, I have a group class. Up to six people can join. It's bring your own project style. All my classes are bring your own project style. You bring your own project to the class, and I will walk you through step-by-step, -step, starting it to uh, like taking it apart, 
refinishing it, putting it all back together. I walk you through step by step. It's not likely you'll finish in one class, but I have it set up so that you can take four classes for the cost of three classes. So if you end up needing to take multiple classes, there's a pretty big discount there. So my classes are three hours long. In that time, you will learn any skill that you want to work on. Your experience is customized to what it is that you want to learn. So if you're just starting, we'll start as a beginner, no experience necessary. If you want to learn how to do deep button tufting, we can work on just that skill. What I do is I kind of give you a task and I bounce around from every student giving everyone tasks as they work on them, answering questions as they go. The cool part is, is you actually get to learn from not just your project, but projects of everybody else getting involved as well. So it is a really great learning experience and it's a really great way to build community around a skill that you're trying to learn. Uh, I highly recommend it. If you take my classes, you can also, I mean, you don't have to do that. You don't have to take my classes to join my group, but I also have a private group on Facebook called the Local Upholstery Club. You can join that and if you are working on a project from home and you get stuck, you can take pictures, you can take video, you can post questions. Tag me if you want me to see it and answer it, but there are people, there are about 900 people in that group from all walks of life, from various levels of experience, from looky-loo to having been an upholsterer for 50 years, and they are happy to give their knowledge to you as well. It's a really incredible experience uh, of community when you're trying to learn something. I um, am self-taught from the DIY community and I was not welcomed into the upholstery industry with open arms and I want that to be the opposite experience for you because we need you to stick around and we need you to do this because there's a shortage of upholsterers out there right now and we need more skilled tradespeople so that we can keep our businesses open. Right now a lot of the businesses that are uh, still in business after manufacturing went overseas and mass production became the way of the land. Um, they're literally aging out of the business and they haven't passed down the traditions. So there's nobody to take their place. And the upholstery industry is at the highest demand that it's ever been, especially since COVID when everybody started redeveloping and redesigning their spaces. And there's just not enough of us to keep up with that demand. So I'm trying to teach as many people as I can how to do this so they can learn how to do it and maybe make a couple bucks off of it or even just make your own cool stuff. I am now getting into the habit of making my own cool stuff after having run a fab shop for six years uh, and it's really fun to get back into doing it for fun. I'm gonna iron this as you guys go just so I can, do you have other, do you see any other yeah, questions, Thomas? A really interesting one that I'm kind of, uh, I'm curious about a little too. Can you learn how to do boat seats? You can. So. Uh, Soft furnishings upholstery is, this is like leaking, is very transferable to auto marine upholstery. It's extremely transferable to auto marine upholstery. Uh, but there are some techniques and skills involved in auto and marine upholstery that are not covered in soft furnishings upholstery. Um, so I would seek out an expert in that area to learn that specific skill. But if you're learning upholstery, like, Auto marine industry is probably more high demand than this industry and it's high end like prices. You could charge whatever the hell you want for that because if they own a boat, yeah. they've got money. And they'll pay it. Like they 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 know about, you know, the the quality and the value of the skill. What's, what's the adage for boats? Bust out another thousand? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or three. Yeah. Or three. Question from Jessica Crane that you might absolutely love to hear. I am just starting my upholstery business in Cincinnati. Any tips for the first year? Yeah. Uh, so I don't know. I, are you guys able to hear these questions? If someone could let me know in the in the comments if you can hear Thomas, because you can't hear Thomas, I'll repeat the question. But uh, the question was from what was her name? Uh, Jessica Crane. Jessica Crane, and she asked, she said she's just getting started an upholstery business and wonders if I have any tips. Uh, so I want you to know that personally, this is coming from someone who closed their upholstery business two years ago. Not because they didn't have enough business, but because I couldn't keep up with the stress of the demands of the job. I was working 15 hour days, seven days a week for six years straight just to keep a, roof, a shop roof over my head. So for the first couple of years, maybe in the first five years, Avoid getting into a brick and mortar if you are able to legally do this from your home. And I think in our town, we were able to run an e-commerce business and we sold our products online at first. So until we were ready to move into the taking clients step, we did e-commerce from home and then we moved into manufacturing where we had our own brick and mortar. 
I would avoid getting a brick and mortar at all costs because that's what's going to suck up all of your profit. You don't need a giant warehouse to do upholstery in to make money doing it. I'm working out of a community maker space. My overhead is $220 a month and that's it. And I can come and go as I please. I have access to tools that you wouldn't even believe. CNC routers, CNC plasma cutters, welders, uh, uh, embroidery machines, vinyl cutters, 3D printers, laser cutters. Like I could run a business making just about anything from one of these spaces. And this is where I come to work on my projects. This is where I'm here right now. I've reserved this space in this classroom today to run this classroom to teach you guys about what it is that I'm doing. There are over a thousand maker spaces in the United States. So you probably have one near the, you that you can use. If you don't have one, you don't need all the big fancy tools right away. Get the ones that make your job easier and do that and then my last piece of advice is maintain a one in one out one on deck policy i added the one on deck thing so if anybody <laughs> has been following me for the past couple of years with me like preaching one in one out one in one out one on deck do not have a wait list because every project that you have on that wait list when one gets set back they all get set back so the last couple of years of my business, I had a year long wait list. We stopped taking clients more than a year before we closed our doors for good because we just couldn't keep up anymore. So if you have one project come in, likely you're taking a deposit for that project and you're not gonna get paid until it goes out. You're motivated to move the project out the door faster. You have shorter lead times, which is attractive to clients. And you have happier clients who are not waiting for other projects to fall apart for you to get to theirs. I had a really difficult time once we had that wait list posting pictures and images of projects that I completed on social media from our business because these clients were babysitting everything that was that we were doing and asking, why aren't you working on their The stress of dealing with clients is the number one reason why we closed our business because it's too stressful to try and maintain the quality of a product while working 15 hour days, seven days a week for six years straight and to fall apart to pieces in any way. Like if one slip up and you're pissing everybody off. So one in, one out, one on deck and have a mailing list that people can join so that you can just broadcast when you're available to start another project. You will create a demand for yourself that is like unheard of. I promise you the second that you put a staple remover in your hands, everyone you know is going to say, oh, I have a project for you you can practice on. You are not going to have a shortage of clients. Okay, I got steam. I'm going to do this now. Do we have any other questions, Thomas? Um, two, two, more, more commentary than uh, questions at the moment. Um, That's fun. I'd love to hear it. Jessica says, um, well, first off, she says, this tips. thank you. So she's very appreciative of the advice. When I'm working out of our home, our dining room and living room floor has become my work space. My kids wore shoes in the house for two years while I worked from my dining room floor. And I would watch like Fixer Upper on repeat like every single day. So I started doing this in 2015 when I was laid off of my marketing gig. Uh, I was a stay at home mom for the first time and I just wanted to uh, hang out with my kid and do something fun. My husband had a good job and I didn't really like, I was still doing marketing consulting from home, but I had no reason to like work full time. So I just started pulling this stuff out of the trash and restoring it and posting about it on Facebook because I was doing it for myself. And then people started to watch me post and then ask if I could make something for them. And then little by little, they would buy everything that we made. I remember the first chair that I sold for real money was a wing back that I made uh, with two different patterns. I had a floral pattern on the front and a polka dot pattern on the back. And my husband is like, no one is going to buy that. <laughs> that looks insane. And I was like, no, I think there's a market for that. Like, I think people are into funky looking furniture that you can't find anywhere else. And uh, that's a fact. That's exactly what happened. So uh, I sold that first chair in four hours on a Facebook group. It was before Facebook Marketplace. And as soon as that happened, I told my husband, go get every fucking wingback chair you can find. And those things are in the trash. Like they are, you can find them free all the time. And I am, I probably spend a good two, three hours a day, not consecutively, but on Facebook Marketplace uh, looking for furniture finds. And I have a storage unit where I keep all the free stuff that I find so I can use. So you guys are not going to believe this, but look at the, how this, like all of those wrinkles are gone. 
I'm so happy. I was so stressed out about this. Okay, so now we have to sew these panels to the front of this seat. I've marked where the tops are because that's where I need to connect all the edges. And the first thing I gotta do is sew the box together and then sew the box to the top of the seat. So Thomas, I'm gonna get my sewing machine out and going. Can okay. you help me angle the cameras so that we can yeah. see that? So we also have a question from Off to a Good Home, or Off to Good Home. Does a um, maker space need special equipment uh, like a sewing machine? Um, to in order for me to come there so I will say that it is helpful for the makerspace to already have the tools I will need which is just a sewing machine and an air compressor and hoses and a stapler that's the only thing I need because everything else I can bring with me um, if they have it then they don't need it but I am willing to travel the deal is though if you're a makerspace and you want me to come out there there's a 30 day marketing package that comes with that and Thomas can attest to you uh, my professional marketing skills that I once used to win an election yep. as a politician uh, that we've been using here at MakerWorks to sort of push our membership. Uh, there's a lot of value in that package. And so I'm looking for makerspaces to uh, pay for the cost of travel. So if they have the tools already, I'm just gonna fly out there for the weekend and hang. But if they don't have the tools already, I gotta rent a U-Haul. So that's a different expense altogether. But a lot of these makerspaces do have tools of these nature, this nature. So I think we're gonna bring, oh, okay. I think this side, at least oh, for okay. one of them. Okay, got it. So out one cover, in one cover. Out. Yeah. Okay. I think so. I'm just trying to get creative now. Or maybe like yeah, off right. The side. And I think yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That looks great. Awesome. Let me get a rolly chair. Oh, you stole my yeah. chair. I'll get another chair. No, no, go for it. No, I can use one of these guys. It's fine. So yeah, part of why I'm uh, air quotes interning with with Kim today is to <laughs> learn this marketing and videography and to kind of flex that muscle. Well, I will say that Thomas is teaching me a lot about the vide videography part. <laughs> I did not intend for this to go this deep and it is very cool. So I need to sew this box together first. I need to show these short sides to these long sides before I sew it to the cushion top. So I have the tops marked on here so that I can make sure that I am sewing the nap all in the same direction. If you don't sew it in the same direction, these can appear to be two different colors. This is a really good example of that right here. So if your patterns are not facing the same direction, that velvet will look like a dark velvet and a light velvet. So I'm gonna turn this back around. Oh, you couldn't even see it. This is, so this is in the proper direction and that is flipped in the wrong direction. So you do wanna make sure that these are in the right direction before you sew them together. So I have my top here and I have all of these sides marked with the top as well. I can set this one aside and I'm just going to sew these together. Now I use a half inch seam allowance. You can use whatever size seam allowance you want. Half inch is pretty standard. And I have a lot of half inch marks right here on, my, on the top of my machine that I can follow. So I'm just gonna do that. But they have really great magnetic guides that you can use or you can make your own marks. I have an etch here. I have ruler marks here. This is how I know it's gonna be a half inch. So I'm just going to this is an industrial sewing machine. I'm going to show you a little bit <laughs> about all the moving parts. So uh, I use a Conso 206RB-2, and MakerWorks actually has a Conso 206RB-1. So they're basically the same exact machine. This is a walking foot sewing machine, which means there's uh, just like a domestic machine, there's a little feed dog down here with the jagged teeth that like goes in circles to push your fabric back. This has that, but it also has a very heavy walking foot that when the feed dog is up, the foot touches it, pinches the fabric and pushes it through the machine. So if you find yourself struggling to use a domestic machine with upholstery fabric, you might see yourself forcing that fabric through or pulling it out the other side. Do not do that with one of these machines. While this machine works exactly like a domestic machine, it will also sew through your bones. It doesn't care. It doesn't care how thick your bones are. It'll sew right through it. 
So I try to keep my hands out of this area so that I don't actually slip my fingers through there. So it's a very powerful machine. It's no harder to use than a regular machine, but it can sew, sew through your bones. So you have to be very careful and you have to have a lot of respect for it. So this is the manual flywheel. You can't see it here, but there's a little wheel on the side here. There's a pedal at the bottom. You can see my foot down here. This pedal, when you push it, the machine goes faster the harder you push it. It goes slower the later you push it. So you're gonna use that to adjust your speed. My motor also has a speed adjuster on it so I can slow that default speed up or down when I want to. Um, and uh, I like to go to slow pace and I keep my machine at a slow pace because my students are always using it and I don't want them to freak out. So the only time I ever worry about the color of my thread is when I'm doing a top stitch. Otherwise, I'm either using a black, a gray, a brown, or a white thread on my upholstery fabric. And I think that is, that's probably true for everybody else. So I'm just going to get this under the presser foot. I don't, you can't see from that side, but if you're watching on TikTok, or uh, I don't know, I don't know which one this is. I think this one's Instagram. But if you're watching over here, then you can see the little button that I push with my knee, which actually lifts this presser foot right here. So I lift the presser foot to get that under and I get it set up to that half inch mark. I'm going to start sewing a couple stitches forward and then I'm gonna sew a couple stitches backwards and then I'm gonna sew a couple stitches forward again. And that sort of like ties a knot in the end of that stitch so that it doesn't come unraveled. So let's start that. Couple forward couple backwards. If you can see from this camera angle right here, this lever here is my reverse. I have to push it up and hold it up in order for it to stay going in reverse. The second I let it go, the second it goes back in the right direction. Now I will say that velvet also might surprise you is really difficult to sew. It's really slippery and so it slips off and sometimes you have to account for that shearing when you put the pieces together. When I'm done here, you'll see that this piece is actually gonna be a little bit longer on one end now, even though they were cut at the same width from the same piece, because it has slipped down. So you can see that a little bit this way, because it is just a little slippery. Thomas, can you get me yes. a um, pair of scissors over there? Yeah. Now, I have started by sewing this short side to the long side first. Uh, so that I didn't mistakenly sew the short side to the short side. So I'm gonna trim this off. I wanna make sure I leave a long tail and that I'm not pulling this string tight when I cut it because otherwise it'll snap back and unthread your machine. So I let the string loose, trim it. You can trim both sides. If Tough Mary is watching, she would she'd be so proud of me that I taught you to trim both sides right here at the machine before you get the piece to the chair. So now I have these two sides put together. That looks great and now I need to put these two sides together. So I got my top side here, make sure it's top there, face to face. And then I can flip this over and sew this short side to this long side. And I'm gonna do the same exact way. Lift my presser foot up with my knee, line it up at the half inch mark, a little forward, a little backwards, a little forward, and we're off. Now you don't have to pedal to the metal so this straight line in one quick line. You can pump it so that you can go a couple inches at a time. You can go up a little bit and then stop and then up a little bit and then stop. What I do suggest though is whenever you stop, you make sure that your needle is down inside your fabric. That's gonna make it so that if you accidentally lift your presser foot, you're not gonna lose your stitch. So always make sure your needle is in your fabric whenever you stop sewing. So this is an example of just kind of pumping it a little bit, but I am pretty confident I'm just going to run it all the way through and then back stitch the bottom. We have any questions, Thomas? Yes, we do actually from Anjanette Hayes. Uh, she's asking, they're asking, is there a certain weight recommended per thread for that type of fabric? Um, and also asking uh, whether or not you offer patterns for person chairs. Oh, that's a good question. I don't offer patterns for person chairs, but I'm not opposed to uh, I'm not opposed to making them, I guess. But what I will say, uh, Parsons chairs themselves are basically a wrap and staple chair. So you just need rectangles to, fig to do that. You could probably do a whole Parsons chair without sewing a single stitch. What was the first part of that question? Uh, is there a recommended thread weight um, for that type of fabric? Right, so all different types of fabrics require different thread weights. Upholstery fabric, for the most part, you can handle, I use a 200 pound, uh, uh, wax bonded nylon thread for my upholstery machine and I can use that for most of my projects except for lightweight fabric 
you can't use that thick of a fabric for, uh, or that thick of a thread for that fabric, that's probably even best suited to go on a domestic machine with a nylon fabric, but you're probably not gonna need it to be that intense. But I use a 200 pound uh, nylon wax bonded thread on most of my projects, but when you're using leather or vinyl, you might wanna use a, a slightly heavier fabric. Now, I don't do a lot of leather or vinyl. I tend to use like a thinner one, so I very rarely will end up changing my threads out unless it's like a different color for a top stitch. But, um, but yeah, I do suggest that you research a little bit more about the material that you're working with to make sure that you're using the right type of thread. So I have this together, and my next step is to sew it to the box front. So let me get that. So. This is the top of the seat. What time is it, Thomas? Yeah. Well, it's only noon. Oh, cool, we're doing good. We're making good time. Cause we've been not doing a lot, like just answering a lot of questions. So I need to sew this box to this box front. I need to find the back. This is the back so that I don't sew to that. I'm going to be sewing this to the front. The first thing I wanna do is mark the center of the front of the boxing that I'm putting on there. And to do that, I'm just folding this whole piece in half. I'm making sure my seams line up because the center of the front panel is what's most important to me. I'm going to prioritize that. And once I have it folded in half, I'm gonna use my scissors, I don't know if you can see it here, and make a little notch. And here, I'll do it for this one. Make a little notch so that you can see a tiny little arrow to where I can line up my centers. So I have marked the center on this panel, which is the boxing, and now I need to mark the center on the front of this box cushion. So I'm gonna fold this in half, and the same exact way I just did the boxing, I'm going to make a little snip in this corner to mark an arrow. Now I can put the two pieces together, face to face, and match up those arrows and then the seams should magically align with where it needs to go here on the corner. And the way that I know if it magically aligned where it needs to go on the corner is that the edge of this front box, which we cut to be exactly the same width as the front box, should come right to the edge of that. So this is in a good spot. Now, you're gonna be tempted to start sewing at one end of the boxing and go all the way to the other end. You can do that, but like I told you before, velvet is slippery and it moves on itself, it shifts under it. Uh, if you do that, start at one end and work your way to the other, your whole pattern is going to shift and compound all the way to the end, so your corners are not gonna line up in the front at a 90 degree angle the way you want them to. So the way I sew these together is I start in the middle, work my way around one side, and then I come back to the middle and work my way around the other side. And that helps me stretch out and evenly distribute my fabric around the front the way it's supposed to go. Uh, even working with a finicky fabric like um, velvet. So before I start sewing, I do wanna make sure that this end lines up with the edge of the front panel because this is, I'm gonna be sewing down this way. And using that same seam allowance, the half inch seam allowance, I'm going to be running this through my sewing machine using that guide. So I'm gonna drive my needle down in there to hold that in place while I double check these. Okay, everything looks good. I'm going to hold these two corners together so that they don't slip and move. And what I'm gonna do is I'm not gonna backstitch this area actually now. I'll backstitch it when I finish it at the end. But if I backstitch it too much here, I could put too many threads in that area and it could pull that front down a little tight just in that area, which will look like a little dimple. And I don't wanna do that. If I don't backstitch right here, I'll be able to pull that out and loosen it and fix it when I go to put the final backstitch in. So I'm going to make my way to the end of this, hold on, I'm not quite there yet. So we have a question. I'm ready. Uh, Moshognesi, I believe is how I pronounce that. Do you mark the center on the front of the chair? 
Uh, yes, yeah, so I mark the center on the front of the chair and I also mark the center on the back of the chair uh, because when I, and sometimes I'll mark the center on the sides of the chair if it's geometrical and it makes sense. Uh, and that's because when you're first putting your material on, before you drill a bajillion staples into it, there are four places you want to lock it down. And that's in the middle in the front, in the middle in the back, and in the middle on the sides. Once you get it pulled and stretched in all of those directions, putting everything else into place becomes so much easier. So I mark my centers on everything at every step of the way. All right, so I'm getting ready to sew. I'm gonna sew a line all the way down from the center here to this corner. When I get to this seam, I'm gonna drop my needle down and then I'm going to pivot this to sew in the other direction so that I make a 90 degree turn right here. That'll make more sense when I get to it. It doesn't make sense when I'm explaining it. So I'm going slow so that I can make sure I am keeping with my guide because uh, velvet is slippery. I have a guide right here that I'm running this against and when I get closer to the edge of my fabric I have a guide closer to the presser foot that'll help keep me on track. And I already see this is getting like bigger than a half inch. Yeah so oh this is such a good I'm so glad you guys get to see this. So here you can already see where the velvet has slipped away. I don't know if you can see it as good in this but the velvet is already climbing. It's already moving out of place. So I have to go back and I have to take that stitch out and I have to do better and go slower to make sure everything stays lined up properly. You wanna be very careful at this stage to not leave too many marks. Sometimes this fabric is not self healing. So uh, sewing through it at any capacity will leave permanent marks. And it looks like that's what we're close to doing up here. I'm very nervous, uh, but we might be able to seam it out. So you can see the mark where I just like sewed through that. So tangential or slightly related question, Kim. Mm -hmm. Can you use pins to hold the velvet in place or will it mark it? Uh, good question. And it sounds like you answered it yourself. <laughs> um, so you can use pins to hold the velvet in place. Uh, try to put the pins uh, where the like on the outside of the stitch not on the top of the box or the side of the box where you're going to see it from the front um but you know where the neat where the seam is not going to be seen on the inside um but sometimes it's self-healing like you do you want to do some of these tests on your fabric can you iron it can you put acetone on it and i'll tell you the reason why it's important to know that is because if you get certain things on your fabric acetone can clean it off really well um, but sometimes acetone will melt your fabric. But there's, you want to test your fabrics uh, before you, you know, experiment on them in real time because uh, otherwise you find yourself destroying fabric you can't get more of. Yes, it is bad. Especially I had a client that their fabric was 250 bucks a yard. That was not a fun day for me. <laughs> It was not fun. Okay, I'm gonna make sure. Th so that's where I started. I started off from. Okay, we're gonna go very, very slow. And we're gonna just do this a couple inches at a time. And I'm going to use my half inch seam guide that's marked up here at the top instead of down here at the side so that I can keep a better eye on my edges up here because all I need to do is keep these two edges lined up together the whole way down add a half inch and then it'll go straight so I'm just doing as you can see I'm going very slow even with velvet leather and vinyl I like to go really slow because so much can go wrong and it can pucker and it can make permanent damage this uh, fabric is a lot more forgiving than I anticipated so I'm pulling this back a little bit so that I can make sure that the edge lines up. And I can already tell that it's still finding its way up a little bit, but I'm comfortable with the consistency is what I'll say. So I'm going to take this line all the way to the seam where these are connected so that I can pivot this and sew it in this direction. I'm going to get to the seam and drop the needle in the seam and then I'm going to pivot it. I will have to make a snip in the fabric to make a relief cut so that that pivots nicely. But we'll, I'll show you that when we get there. How are the questions looking, Thomas? We got any? Yeah, um, no, we're looking pretty good on, on things. Um, 
Good. All right, so I'm almost to that seam. When I get close, sometimes I get nervous. I'm going to pass it. So I just walk it by manually moving the flywheel on my sewing machine until the needle is right in that seam. And then I can lift my presser foot and pivot everything in this direction. But all of my fabric buckles right here and it's making it real difficult for me to pivot that cleanly. So I'm gonna make a little snip. I don't wanna cross my seam, so I'm actually gonna lift this up and put it a couple stitches back. I'm going to make a cut right next to the seam, but I don't wanna cut through my seam because I don't want that to unravel. So I'm just making a snip less than a half inch long, getting everything back in place and walking it back to that stitch. You can put that snip in before you get to that stitch so you don't have to go backwards. Lift up my presser foot. This part of my boxing will stay straight and the rest of this is gonna go around. So I can run, it looks like my seam is gonna get pushed flat going in this direction, that's fine. So I wanna make sure that my edges line up on this side and that my fold here is at a 90 degree angle and that it is not going to be so through any wrinkles that where the needle is lined up is just two flat pieces of fabric one on top of each other once i get it in place that half inch that stitch where i line the needle up is at the half inch seam allowance so when i turn it it's already turned at a half inch seam allowance and i can just keep going straight so that's what i'm going to do and i'm going to take this all the way to the end once we get this box top sewn, we're going to be ready to take it over to the chair, make the cuts, and put it in place. Ooh, you know what you could do for me, Thomas? Yes. Give me a hose going. A hose? An air hose. I don't think I have any plugged in to my uh, air hose, and I'm not sure if my air hose is plugged in either. Okay, cool. Also, we have a, another question. Is the small seam open? Oh, the small seam on the corner here? No, I actually sewed that close so that it would go flat in one direction. Uh, it could be open too, but I'm really nervous about that being open because of how thick this fabric is and you being able to see right through that seam to the back. And I would have to put a piece of fabric or material behind it so you couldn't see it. And it's hard to do that when you can't sew it in place. And I'm not interested in putting a top stitch on this. So I sewed that seam flat closed going in the directions of the arm so that it would lay flat on the chair. So I'm getting to the end here and I can put a back stitch and now I'm all set with that. You can even see, like, as I'm using this, like, my fingerprints are being left in this material. My nails are scratching it. And some velvets, that will become a permanent thing. Like, that's, <laughs> it'll become a permanent problem on your fabric. So in order to start, go back to the middle. First, let me show you what we just did here, because this looks great. This is the seam on the top. So now we're coming back to the middle here, but this time our boxing is gonna be on the bottom and our box top is gonna to be on top. So the direction changes a little bit, but the fundamental is the same about turning corners. Oh, you're fine. So I'm just gonna get this. I have a microphone now lined up at the half inch mark from where our stitch started last time. Drop my needle in so it doesn't go anywhere. And then I'm going to sew a half inch. Now this is um, a little cut out of whack here, so it looks a little different on this side. But I promise you it's at a half inch. And you'll even see this, I don't know if you guys can even see that closer, but there's velvet just kind of slipping down anyway. It doesn't care that I'm trying to hold it in place. I almost have to pull this one over and under correct on this side to get them to meet when they get under the presser foot. So I'm taking this all the way down to the seam and then I'm going to pivot. It's really just slipping down there, man. I gotta undo this. I lost control. I did a, a $4,000 dog bed <laughs> with velvet like this. 
Uh, it took me two weeks to get the welt on straight. I cried so much because I didn't want to, like it's such a simple design, but because the velvet was so hard to work with, um, it was one of my most nightmare. He died before it was finished. <gasps> yeah, I know. It was crazy. <laughs> it was a couch. It was a sectional. It was a one-piece L-shaped couch. It was not a sectional, but it should have been a sectional. And now we know why people order sectionals and not one-piece L-shaped couches, because it might surprise you that you can't fit that through most doorways. <laughs> It is, was a nightmare. I hated that project. It did turn out beautiful, though. Same, almost, I bet it was the same kind of fun altogether. Ooh, tricky, tricky, tricky. Okay, we're coming up to this corner. We're gonna drop the needle in right where the seam is. And then we, again, are going to make a snip in the boxing, not the box top, a less than a half inch right down along the edge of that thread so that I can lift my presser foot, needle stuck down, and just pivot in this direction. And then make sure, oh, I lost my bobbin. <laughs> oh my God, I lost bobbin chicken. So we have to go back and sew that whole thing. But right now I got to make sure that my bobbin is threaded. We got any questions? Oh, fantastic. We love to see it. Well, let's take this time to remind everybody then that if you're in these lives and you're learning something or hanging out or having fun that you violently tap the screen to like this content for as long as possible because that helps drive my content to the for you pages which helps people find me uh, which helps me sell classes and uh, keep the upholstery industry alive yeah. so you uh, can join me live here on Tuesdays anytime to learn upholstery for free but I also do my in-person workshops and virtual workshops all I ask is that you like the content while you're in there and engage as much as possible because that's how I sell classes. So I see a lot of likes over here. I'm not sure how it works on the Instagram side, but if you guys could just tap, 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 tap the whole time you're there, um, that is going to be of more value to me than if you were to do uh, buy gifts and send me gifts because um, I only get fractions of those pennies and then TikTok or Instagram gets the rest. But when you guys are liking this content and engaging in it, I get, I get hundreds of new followers every time I have one of these. And I sell classes every time I, I think I can see on my phone that I've already sold a class. So uh, it really goes a long way to help promote my business when you guys are just being super cool and tapping the like button. So this is going to get loud because I have to wind my bobbin now. So I'm not going to bother talking during that time. So you can talk amongst yourselves. is set up so that you can actually um, <clears throat> wind your bobbin and sew at the same time but I never have ever set that up because I'm a dum-dum but you should do that because it's really not good for you to run your machine that ragged already shared into my maker space for a camp hopefully in what does it say Phoenix Ooh, I would love to go to Phoenix something about me is that I actually I have not traveled a ton I've been to New York a couple of times and as a kid we traveled to Florida a bunch but I would love to see more of the United States so I'm really excited about this upholstery camp uh, coming up in spring and summer so if you're wondering what it is um, I last year did some very successful weekend upholstery retreats here locally where people got to come stay with me for the weekend and then we did three days of eight hour upholstery intensive workshops here at my local makerspace and we had guest uh, speakers 
<clears throat> like Sharon O'Connor from Vintique Upholstery over in the UK. She is, uh, I, th I think I might see her picture here actually. She is one of the upholsterers on the show Money for Nothing. So on that show, they uh, intercept people at the garbage dump and they take their furniture and they give it to local makers to refinish or reimagine and then they sell it and then they take that profit and they give it back to the person who was going to throw the piece away in the first place. And Sharon O'Connor is one of the amazing upholsterers on that. I think I see her picture here. So if you see her, Vintique Upholstery, definitely go follow her. She was one of my guest speakers at one of my retreats. Uh, Lindsay Madsen of Madam of Making, who is part of this New Chair New Year challenge that we're doing here with this project. She was a guest speaker on that. We've had uh, Folio Fabrics came on and was a guest speaker. So we had a really great uh, upholstery, weekend upholstery retreat experience last year. We did three of them, two of them sold out. This year, I want to make it more accessible. So 1600 bucks a pop is not something that everybody can afford. And I want to see more of you because I know that there's a lot, a lot of upholstery opportunities for people to learn in their area. So I'm looking for makerspaces willing to host me so that I can come bring these workshops to you for the weekend. So if you have a local makerspace that you um, would like to see me come to, contact that local makerspace, send them to the weekend upholstery camp link in my bio, and let them know that I'm offering this service. If you are the one that connects me with that makerspace and I sign a deal with them to come out there and teach, you get to come to that weekend upholstery retreat for free. So it's a really cool opportunity to learn upholstery for free and to let your makerspace know that you are interested in bringing upholstery to your local area. So um, that's a good way that you can do that. But I am, so you might find, if you should Google a search, because there are, a handful of people just like me all over the United States, uh, like the Whimsical Chair, Lindsay Madsen, I'm not sure she does workshops, but I know that she provides educational content. Blue Roof Cabin is also doing this swash upholstery, uh, renewed by Riley. I'm trying to cover everybody and everything is uh, the Frederick House. These are all people working on the New Year New Chair Challenge with me. Um, Follow them because they also provide a lot of educational content. Nicole Crowder. Yeah. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and also uh, worth noting is that you should be following all of these makers. All of us have prize giveaways that we're giving for this contest, which is not really a contest, like we're not competing against each other. We're just all, we've committed to doing a chair for the new year. This is the chair that we're doing, and we're using it as a way to educate all of you about upholstery. But there are a lot of opportunities to win some really cool prizes. For instance, I'm giving away a furniture nerd hoodie and a four class package, whether it be upholstery workshop or virtual upholstery workshops or in-person workshops, um, you'll get a four class package. So if you're following me, you're following Madam of Making, you're following all of the other upholsterers uh, who are listed in this chat at the very top of them, then you will have a chance to win some of these really great prizes, of which I heard that there were a lot of, like a tool package and, uh, free classes, all kinds of cool stuff. So, oh my gosh. So this is going south very quickly. I have to undo all of this. So another way that you can try and keep this fabric on track is to staple it sometimes. Um, Thomas, yes. can you give me the office stapler from the front desk? Yes, also, <laughs> um, question from Amanda. Will you have a video on TikTok or YouTube? I love this and can't watch now. Uh, oh, so I am trying to use clips from this to make long form content for YouTube, so please be patient with me. I do go live every Tuesday, and uh, on Instagram, this will be posted live so you can go back and watch it later, and I'll try to download it to also get it on Facebook too. Uh, but please understand that editing videos is an extremely time consuming process. And while I'm trying very hard to get to long form educational content for you, it's very difficult. But what is easy for me is to do these lives so that I can just sort of work with you while I'm working on a project. And it sucks that not everybody can tune in with me on a Tuesday. So I am working on it. We are saving the recordings and we are making content from them, but it's just taken some time. Um, but you will be able to watch this particular live on Instagram and Facebook 
uh, later today after it gets posted. As long as my phone doesn't die. We gotta keep an eye on that too, oh. Thomas. Okay. How am I doing? Oh, my microphone looks good, still charged. I think, it's, on this one. I think it says 34 percent on that one. We might want to get that one a battery plugged in soon. Okay. That one, okay. Got it. Um, let me check on your transponder. Transponder's doing pretty solid on both. Transponder and mic are doing okay. Yeah, these seem like they're doing okay. Yeah. The one thing is if we disconnect that it's gonna, and charge it, it's going to disconnect your uh, mic. Can we connect it to the Instagram phone? Will um, it connect? I think it will auto switch, yes. Okay. So I we. Okay. So. Maybe we should do that now, so that way we can get that phone plugged in before it gets so low that we can't get it charging. Thomas, thank you so much for your help You're today. You guys, awesome. Thomas is a goddamn peach, first of all, but he's also an incredible creator. He has, um, his business is Tusano Trading Company. He's let, me, a, let me grab something out of my truck while you... Yeah, he's a fine woodworker. He uh, makes uh, really cool stuff for the for gaming accessories out of wood. He makes cutting boards and charcuterie boards and tabletops, like really cool stuff. You can follow him on Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook, I believe. So I'm just using this office stapler to put some strategic staples in to hold this closed while I sew it. Now, I don't want the staples to cross that stitch line but if I do I'm making sure that they go long so that my needle will go over them and not through them I don't want it to get all messed up so I'm going through and making sure that I'm pulling this all straight in the right place and every probably inch or so I'm putting a staple so that I don't lose so it doesn't slip right. as I go to the so the next time you, you have a free second, you want to talk about what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bring it. Uh, oh, okay. Go through to the other. So the next time you, you have a free second, you want to talk about what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bring it. Uh, oh, okay. And play. Like think of your your Cracker Barrel or your little pub games. That's kind of what I one of the things I aim to make, as well as things for hospitality and tabletop role playing. Because this is my dice and snack tray uh, that I do. And then uh, Kim also works to help us develop a class and like a holiday uh, gift market where we would make things and then more or less uh, put them on sale for, for people to offer as experiences. Like you could learn to make this in the, in the class. Thank right, without any, without yeah. any experience whatsoever. And Thomas is a really great teacher yeah. um, who's really down to earth, kind of like me. So learning from him is really, really easy. Yeah. So have a lot of fun. And, and we just both kind of believe in the concept of maker spaces being valuable third spaces, being valuable to the community and being able to teach you vocational skills and just being just good places in general. So uh, yeah, helping MakerWorks and running our businesses out of here just kind of helps push that narrative and benefits everybody. It really does. And if you uh, don't know if you have a local makerspace near you, I highly suggest you Google makerspace near me. Uh, the first results are typically that there's like two or three really great directories of makerspaces that show up so you can find a makerspace near you on a map. And some of them will even tell you how active they are. So a lot of makerspaces are actually really struggle to stay open. This makerspace is a nonprofit organization and ever since COVID has been struggling to get back to where it was before COVID. So uh, makerspaces really could use your participation and I'm not sure that you're aware of just how useful their resources are. So this particular makerspace is 4,000 square feet. Uh, you as a member have access to all of it, but you do not have to be a member to take classes here or to learn how to use tools here. They have lots of class opportunities for you to take so that you can learn how to use tools. For instance, if you are working at a metal fab shop doing some low end jobs, you can come here and learn how to use the CNC's because CNC operators make a ton of money. And if you can get hired on as a CNC operator with experience, you can get that experience here, then you can elevate your career professionally. So makerspaces have really great assets for you to access like that, um, that can just make making things much easier. Not to mention if you have a garage that's not heated or it's air conditioned in the summertime, 
um, having access to a space like this is really cool. So this is like having a gym membership, but for tools, you can pay monthly fees, or you can pay day passes, or you can pay for credits, and come use the space whenever you like. But most, of, a lot of the tools, especially the dangerous ones, uh, require you to take safety classes, which they call checkout classes here, in order for them to set you loose on them by yourself. Uh, but I will say they will set you loose on them by yourself um, once you've taken that class. So there are really cool things called uh, SOPs, Standard Operating Procedures, throughout this shop, which are basically manuals for all the tools. So if you come in second-guessing yourself, there's a picture, a picture book manual there for you. Um, oh, and this is working really well, by the way, the staples. I didn't explain it to you guys. So I've stapled everything in place so the, the fabric is done. Sorry. Yeah, no, look, yeah, these are, these are the SOPs. These are really great resources to help build your confidence when you're approaching some of these tools because I use the uh, CNC router. Um, I was very nervous to use that for my first time uh, because it's a very expensive machine and I didn't want to break it. But I did good because I had access to that um, SOP and I was able to very easily like follow the picture directions and learn how to use it. So I've made two projects with that so far. And I've only had to help have help changing the tool once. Well, I'm very impressed with my knowledge of the CNC so far. I'm having a lot of fun with it too. So this particular project, this is for the new Chair New Year Challenge with Madam of Making and several other upholsterers over on Instagram. You're going to need to follow all of us in order to benefit from the whole challenge. But there are a lot of really great upholsterers. I'm going to see if I can name them from, mem from my memory. I know them all very well. I follow them. But there's a long list of them and my brain gets scrambled so I can't always do it. So Madam of Making is Lindsay Matson. She's the head of it. And then there is Rhonda from the Wooden Sickle Chair. I'm not going to remember all their first names, so I probably started a really bad precedent. Uh, the Whimsical Chair, Renewed by Riley, Hannah Riley. Uh, Frederick House, I can't, I can't, I can't remember her name. Um, uh, Blue Roof Cabin, Me Loco, and Swatch Upholstery, which I just started uh, following Swatch Upholstery recently. That chick is so fucking cool. I, they're all very fucking cool, but I just discovered Swash Poultry, and I'm like so kind of fangirling out that she's part of this too, along with Lindsay and everybody else. Like, uh, Whimsical Cheer is part of uh, some of the upholstery education that I was receiving when I was um, learning this on my own. So, having uh, being able to do a contest with all these amazing upholsters has been a lot of fun. But go follow all of them on Instagram, and you can follow along with this contest and learn how you can win prizes. Um, you won't regret it. They all make fantastic content. Okay, so, uh, good. That's good. Now I want to definitely take all of these staples out because I don't want them in the chair. But before I get into doing that too deep. Let's go dry fit this cushion. So I'm still going to be putting, um, I'm still going to be putting, I can't think and cut at the same time, a piece of cotton batting on the top of the seat. So I don't want to put it on before I dry fit this because that can sometimes um, mess with the batting like this will it can destroy the batting because it's so fragile so i have finished sewing this so far so good i'm gonna poke out these corners and i removed some material from these corners so that they wouldn't be so bulky and i will poke these out with scissors or a regulator before i do the final push but i just want to make sure that that is so nicely in it is. okay thomas i'm ready to go to the chair now okay you want to help this me out? i'll grab this one okay this also might be the opportunity to um, plug in this to charge oh, because the charger idea. wouldn't reach in the yeah, last you can, spot. I'm done with that sewing machine for right now, so you can actually take that plug. Okay. And maybe this one can stay over here just so we don't go too far from yep, it. Yep, yep. Okay. Uh, the other thing I do have to mention, Kim, mm -hmm. is you did mention about these upholstery shops. Uh, and these upholstery workshops and other maker spaces. Yes. One of the ones that I really would love to see us get involved with, because my personal friend uh, is involved with, I showed you earlier, the Sin Shop. I Ooh. think that'd be, because that's also a destination. Like, imagine people a weekend in Vegas, you know. 
you know, Thomas, um, part of this uh, yeah. experience in Vegas, you know, uh, you know, Thomas, um, part of this uh, yeah. experience every leg of this tour that I go, I'm taking two assistants with me. Ooh, to help. okay. So someone to do camera stuff like you, which you're really, yeah, you're on my good side right now. Girl. Yay! <laughs> So this is, let me see what I'm trying to like find a spot to like. You can set it on this table probably. Oh, just okay. Bring that close. Yeah. Bring the table to, Oh, bring the table. Oh. Okay. That's okay. And then, I know. I've, I like, this is something that I struggle with daily. Okay. And this can probably come down lower if that makes it just a tad easier. Yeah, that does. Okay. Okay. So I've turned this right side out, and now I'm ready to put it on the front of my chair. You can see the difference in color. Like this looks bright blue. Yeah. And this looks pale green. It's That's wild not. even to see the angles. Yeah. So I'm gonna. All of this fabric is gonna get cut and tucked and put through there. I need the front of this to fit on the top, but I have these areas that are sewn that need to get cut first. So I'm turning this back inside out so that I can first fit these corners to the front where they need to go. Okay. We and are then, getting an influx of questions. Oh, great. We have a <laughs> whole bunch lined up. Are they about the upholstery camp? Um, they are about mostly your sawhorses. Oh, yeah. A lot of people. Um, I'll, I'll line them up. I'll try to... Uh, okay, try let's to start with one. Organize them, yeah. Um, let's start with the sawhorses. Because those are getting questions on both platforms. Um, how tall are they? Where where do you get them? Good questions. Let's measure them. I don't know how tall they are. So I got these sawhorses, the black parts of them. I my husband built the boxes for the top of these. But the bottom parts of these sawhorses right here are Husky brand, and they're from uh, uh, Home Depot, and they were twenty six bucks and some change from top bottom to the floor they are 29 inches in height and then I have a three-quarter inch ply nine inch box built up with three inch sides put on the top of it I suggest a wider foot these are shorter because I have eight of these going in class at any given time and I need to fit more space in but my ones at home are 12 inches wide and it's way it's a way better fit so that's the first question um. Where do you source your fabric? So uh, this fabric I got from Joanne Fabrics. There is a fantastic fabric shop local to me called Discount Fabric Outlet. They have discontinued designer fabrics at $7.99 a yard. They don't sell online, you have to go in person. But that's my favorite place to buy fabric at. And then uh, I also get fabric online. So the fabric for the back of this chair is actually from Spoonflower. So the floral fabric that goes back here, I got from I got custom printed from Spoonflower. So that was very exciting. So in, I need to make cuts through here on the seat, and these cuts are going to cross this seam. So I'm actually going to have to unstitch this so that it doesn't like come unraveled unruly before I make cuts in that area. But first, I'm just kind of fitting everything on. So I've aligned the front of my cushion with the front of my seat and the corners are going right to the corner and now I just kind of want to spread out the fabric on the seat so that it's nice and smooth on the surface and I'm pre-tucking it in between the arms and the seat sort of just in that crease one so it doesn't move anywhere and two so I can visually see that the fabric is in the right place before I make any cuts. So this, this all looks good. It'll get tighter as I go. Oh, right here, a little wonky. And I need to unstitch these box sides up to right before this arm because I don't want this to just come unraveled on its own. So I'm going to be responsible and unstitch it instead of cutting through that because I need to make the same cuts here that we did when we made our pattern, which is a Y cut for these barriers, which are the arms and the legs. So I'm going to unstitch this from the end to right about this edge of the arm because that's where it's gonna fold in. And then I'll hand stitch that area when I'm all done to lock it in to make sure that it doesn't unravel. 
But I don't want any of these pull-through pieces unraveling either, which is why I'm detaching this fabric from the outside. You can pre-measure that so you don't sew past that when you're doing this on your own. That's a way smarter way to go about doing it. But I do. So now I need to make my cut for this arm, which needs to be a Y cut, which I have a ton of material that goes around that side, so uh, it's going to be more of a V cut, and I'll show you what I mean by that. So let's get this over top by the arm so you guys can see. And maybe if I pull this up, I hope it's up as far as it'll go. Is that Lindsay is back in here again? Uh, yeah, she's she's listing off for us all the different people that are involved. Oh, yay, I'm so glad. I'm so appreciative of these ladies keeping tabs on all this stuff. I guess this is probably the best angle. So I don't know how to get rid of these comments so that I don't see them. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, Thomas. What's going on? What are we uh, wondering? I cannot see. I'm trying to get this. Um, oops. I do up like that for a minute. I'm trying to get an uh, overhead view. Do we need to do the, uh, the ceiling tile trick again? Yes! Great okay. idea. But that, we're going to be taking this phone. That is the one that needs charging to do that. So re let's remember that. Because <laughs> this is... Oh, this is the Instagram phone. Instagram phone. phone. Yep. yep. Okay. Oh, just, okay. Mike's disconnected, just so you know. Oh. Oh. Yep, that's the no, mic. The... That's a thing. <laughs> it's okay. okay. So we'll come back over here. All right. That's a thing you gotta Yeah, put it up there and I'll move it into place. Just get it right in that corner right there. Okay. Oh, you'll move the chair. Yeah, I'll move. I'll move my stuff into place. Gotcha. This is not, like, this camera, it is so bright blue. This is not bright blue. This is a very desaturated deal. <laughs> okay, good. Now we've got to move that out of the way. Ah, hi, guys. Oh, 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 here we go. That's a good angle. And then we can get this one. Those are the same, they're the same model phone, right? Yeah, well, one's newer than the other. Oh, okay. This one, this is the 23 Ultra, that's a 22 Ultra. But I like keeping my cameras because of this. This, <laughs> like, I like keeping all my old phones so that I can do stuff like this. So my 11-year-old uh, child gets to practice using them in their off time. So I'm pre-tucking this area. I'm about to make a cut right here in front of this arm because this material has to tuck through the arm this way and this material has to come over on the other side. But this fabric is in the way and so is the barrier of this arm. This arm is about one inch thick right here and the pull through spot starts right about there. So if this material was longer, I would make a line going right up through the center of that arm and then it would Y off to the edges. But this is not longer, it's shorter. So I really am just making the V part of that. I don't wanna cross my stitch here. So let's start with that middle line. That line goes right through the center of that leg. And then the other line, I can start right here comes right out to the front edge of this arm. Now I don't want to go right to the outside of it because that'll put a gap between the material here. I'm going just to the inside of it so when I cut that material I can fold it in and cover it there. Now I'm actually going to want um, to make sure that this is a little bit more extra fabric because this is going to get stapled to the front and this fabric will overlap it but that's just to give you an idea. So I have my fabric scissors here and I'm going to cut straight down to the middle of that leg and then Y off and I'm going to stop right when I get to the foam and then this will have this little uh, V here that gets tucked in between the foam and everything else can now come this way. This little tab will fold under up against that arm and this will fit just like this on the outside. So it still looks crazy there. We still got a little ways to go. This is almost ready to go down the other side, but I have to make a cut in the back for that leg. I'm really nervous about uh, making that cut too long, so I'm actually gonna put a staple in the center 
right here, a temporary staple to hold this front down right where I need it. And Thomas was kind enough to get me a hose going. I'm ready. Yeah, well, and also, so I got my, my cool print fabric that's for the back of this couch or chair. I, I had custom printed from Spoonflower. So uh, you can get really cool customized um, fabrics from Spoonflower. They have really good upholstery fabric that you can have directly printed on or any kind of fabric for that matter. Uh, so you could really get any pattern you want. And there's a lot of really creative artists on Spoonflower. So there's a, a lot of offering in terms of the creative stuff, but you can also put your own designs on there too, which is really cool. I'm also gonna put a temporary staple down here in the corner to hold this line down level before I make any other cuts. And then, go ahead. No, you're good. That's a really great question, and I think it's all going to depend on your project, the purpose of your project, and how long you want your project to last. I always tell my students that the top part of your upholstery is only ever going to be as good as the infrastructure underneath. So if you're reupholstering and reusing materials of a chair that has had foam for 50 years, that chair has a very small, short lifespan left on it before it turns to dust, which will make the rest of your upholstery turn to dust too. So keep that in mind. That being said, when you're practicing, you do not have to put all of your money into materials. When you're practicing, I would say, try to reuse whatever materials you can whenever possible. I have people who uh, clean and reuse horsehair, all the natural materials on there. Um, furniture pieces, and I have people who use all brand new materials. Uh, if you're selling a project, if you're not op upfront and open that your materials were reused, you could cause a really chaotic situation with someone with allergies who might be allergic to pets or smokes or anything that might be on those materials before you knew what it was used for. So if you're working with clients, I always suggest to uh, replace all of the materials so that you don't run into that or if you're selling your stuff. Uh, but if you're just practicing, you don't have to go buy all new materials. You can certainly just reuse what you can. That's a great question. So I'm just pushing, I'm, re, I'm replacing this now that I got my staples in. I will see that I'm gonna have to make my cut a little longer here, but I'm not gonna go crazy with that yet. Now I need to make my cuts for the back legs. And the back legs are about two inches wide right here. And you can find that out by putting your fingers inside the couch and feeling the width of that back leg. You're gonna need to know that because your cut is gonna go straight for the middle of the back leg and then it's gonna Y out so that this fabric can go around it. So first I'm tucking this down in the crease here till I can touch the leg with the fabric. That's gonna make sure that I don't make my cut too long so that I can't see my cut on top of my material. So I am smoothing the fabric out and I'm folding the fabric along the angle that that leg is in, which is in this angle, and pre-tucking it down there. So I need a feel for that leg, which is right here. I'm gonna draw a line that goes to the center and then a Y cut for each edge of that leg. How are we doing on questions? We got more? <laughs> oh, great. Yes. Did we verify that people can hear you answering questions? Uh, they, they said it helps to either repeat, repeat it. But Okay, so Thomas was just saying that Lindsay of Madam of Making says that she has a link on her website for fabric resources and upholstery resources. I also sell upholstery supplies and everything on my website. So if you're following all of us, 
you can go over to those websites and you can get links to those resources there. So I'm ready to tuck this side, but I need to make sure that my cuts are right. Everything is kind of shifted a little bit and I still need this cut to go in that leg a little bit more. And I can tell that it needs to get cut more because it's buckling around this arm, which means it's not getting through to where it needs to go. So I made that cut and now I'm going to tuck this fabric. And this is just to remind you guys, this is just a dry fitting we have to take this out <laughs> and we are going to have to do it again. But right now we're dry fitting to make sure that we don't have to um, fix any stitches. These are great angles. I can't wait to download this video to use later. So in this process, you're gonna start to see some of this batting fall apart, which is why I didn't put the cotton batting on right away because it would just fall apart on me. So also another reason to add a little bit more batting because you might lose some. So typically I try to do this dry fit before uh, I put this batting on too, but we've been doing these tutorial Tuesdays kind of in an order and this is just how it is. So pulling this, it's still buckling around this arm so I know I can make those cuts. But I'm not gonna touch it right now for dry fitting purposes. It looks good because I just really wanna make sure that it fits through here. I'm going to finalize these cuts well after uh, <laughs> I have the cotton batting and everything on. So when I go to put it on for the last time. So I need to make a cut against that leg and I'm doing the same thing, pre-tucking this material and pushing it all the way back to the leg till I can feel it. And then opening this up. So this chair is for the new chair, New Year Challenge that I'm doing with Lindsay Madsen of Madam of Making. Uh, and a handful of other really great upholsterers that she has listed here in the comments. I highly suggest you follow everybody. There's lots of prizes to be won this week. I am, yeah, uh-huh. Oh, where's, oh, I'm in the back. I haven't, okay, I see it. I haven't turned the camera, sorry guys. So Wycat, straight to the back, and then open it up. So that this is now what goes in front of that leg and this can get tucked in the back. Now when you're tucking your material into your chair, don't just try cramming it through because it's going to get stuck. You want to thread it through like a needle. So I'm taking the end of this and pushing that through the back first and then I can pull that through much easier on the other side. And it's pretty snug. Okay, that's looking good. And this will fill out even more when I get the cotton on it. And now I also need to unstitch this side up to the arm so that I don't cross that seam. And this will get hand stitched nice and tight. Like the last thing we do when we finish this chair is go hand stitch all the areas that need to be hand stitched. So this will get hand stitched nice and tight. Right at where it meets the arm. So I just need this to come back to where it's right in front of the arm. And then I can fold this in front, pre-tuck along the sides and that Y cut is going to go right for the arm right there. I had my glasses on my head this whole time. I could have been seeing. <laughs> That's another thing is uh, my eyes aren't what they used to be. So I don't know how accurate this is anymore. When I make this other cut, I want to come to the edge of this arm, but I don't want to come out to the front of it because I need this material to sort of fold in front of it to close, to clear, clean it up. So I just want it to go to the edge of it. And if you end up having to like make your cuts longer, remember to go, keep going straight. Don't keep going in a Y because if you keep going in a Y, you're going to make that cut outside that point. So that will go there. Now this part wraps in the front.
And it looks like everything's going to line up good. I do have it pulled over a little too far to the side here. So I'm going to take my front staples out. Nope. This is why it's good to use temporary staples because um, sometimes staple removers can destroy your fabric. So the temporary staples, instead of stapling it flat, you just tip your staple to the side and it leaves a little gap underneath that staple. It makes it easy to pull out so you don't damage your fabric. And if you can't get it out with a staple puller, you can use tweezers. What time we got, Thomas? Oh, geez, now it's going fast, I feel like. Okay, so now that allows me to get closer here. I'm so glad that you guys can learn from it because when I was teaching myself upholstery, I didn't have a lot of resourceful information, but I, there were a lot of upholsterers doing the thing online, uh, but they were not telling you what they were doing. So I had to teach myself upholstery through reverse engineering and uh, trial and error mostly. So I'm really glad you guys are getting something out of it. So this looks good. I'm not going to bother tucking that in because I know that it fits and I don't want to traumatize my batting any more than I already have. So now I'm just going to carefully peel this out. Carefully, it's going to pull a lot of stuff out with it, so I have to go back through and tuck my foam in and batting. Retuck this back and keep that pathway clear so I can get fabric through it. And then I'm going to put a piece of cotton batting on the top of this seat to fill it out. And because this is looking a little nubby, I don't want it to look gross when we're done. So, Thomas, I'm going to go to the cutting table. Oh, what? Cutting table. Okay. If you want to follow me that way. I'm not going to need this paper anymore, so I can move it right on out of the way. Yes, that is, that is something we need. Okay, so now I need my cotton batting. So the batting that is on the chair right now is called poly batting. It's like a polycrylic batting made of plastic. This is a cotton batting. This is actually a hybrid of poly cotton. I think it's 90-10. Uh, and this is what I'm going to be putting on top. And this just gives it a little extra zhuzh. Now, batting in and of itself, its purpose is to put a little bit of air between the foam and the, um, and the fabric so that it fills it out. And this just makes it a little more plump and luscious. So I'm going to put a layer of this on the seat and arms and back as I upholster them to just make it a little bit more plump. So I need to know the measurement of the seat so I know how much to measure off here. Let me measure that real quick. The depth of the seat. 18 inches, so maybe we'll go with like 19. This kind of stretches, so you don't need to be as generous. So I'm gonna measure about 19 inches up this way. And then I, I'm not gonna mark this because it's, it's like scratching your nails on a chalkboard to draw on it. And I don't need scissors because it's much easier to just rip it away like this. So you can measure on both ends so you have a good idea, but tearing it away like this is how you handle it. Okay, now let's get back to here. I'm checking my battery power and everything, guys. We're at 52 here, we're still good there. And this is probably going to need to get plugged in. Okay, so now I can put my cotton batting right on top. I want it to kind of overhang everywhere. 
push it into place. I'm listening. Uh huh. So, so the layers of this chair start with jute webbing underneath. Uh, right here, you can see it on this camera better than you can see it here. And then there's coil springs, and then it's tied with spring twine. Then there's burlap on top of that to give a barrier between the springs and the foam. Because if you don't put burlap on the springs, the springs will cut through the foam over time. So there's burlap and then foam and then bat or dacron batting. That's what also what this is called. And then the cotton batting on top of that. Some people I've seen put cotton batting under their foam to give it a crown, a dome underneath. You can do that too. I've seen it put on in lots of different layers. This is how I put it on. So after I have it in place, I don't need to tuck any of this cotton batting inside my chair and block up my passages. So I'm kind of just gonna tear it away right at the edge here. And if, wherever I hold my hand, it won't tear past. So if I am holding my hand right at the edge, it's going to stay right at the edge. So I can just smooth those out by tucking it in. I'm doing the same thing here at the side. That can get tucked in here. And then I'll do this all around the other side of the chair. I'm just holding it right into that crease. And then I can just punch that back. I don't want to close off any of these openings because that's where I got to tuck my fabric. And now up at the front here, I need to pull it away at the edge so that it will blend into the top. I don't want any of this coming over the side. I just want it on the top layer. You might want it going over the side. That's your personal taste. That's not what I'm trying to do with this particular chair. I don't need that much girth there. So I'm just holding my hand at the top edge of the face of this chair to tear away all of the excess cotton material so that I can come back through and just press it down. And it felts it right into the side and then you cannot see the transition from this cotton batting to the foam and the batting that goes up to front. It stays nice and smooth. That looks so good. Okay, let's move this back a little bit further and get up a little bit higher maybe. Because now we're gonna put that fabric right back on. And I think give you guys more of a Why am I using both Dacron and the cotton? Because I wanted extra. So when I make oh, my right. you, okay. when I make my box cushions on my um, on my foam, I don't account for the batting. I want the batting to be filling out the cushion cover. So I had the poly batting on first, and so I put the cotton batting on to be an extra filler after I made my cushion measured to the actual foam. So it's just yeah. going to overstuff it. Okay. That, it did come from two different people. Uh, yeah. So. How many inches is the foam for the seat did you use? This particular seat has two inches of foam. Depending on, like a couch cushion might have three, four, five, six inches of foam, depending on the use of it. Uh, this is just a two inch medium firm foam on springs. Uh, two inches is good for over top of spring. Sometimes one inches is good. Sometimes one inches is enough. You might be able to um, feel the springs through that. So we have our cushion cover now with cuts made, but they'll have to be extended. So I'm just going to place this on first. Oh, we forgot to remove the staples. So we have to staple this velvet down to hold it in place. Removing those. These are just office staples uh, that we put in the seam to hold the velvet together because velvet is really slippery, especially when you sew it, and it doesn't all stay lined up and it can make you cry. So if you don't want to cry, you can staple it with an office stapler. I have seen upholsterers leave these staples intact. That's not what I'm about. So I don't want to do that.
I don't want some I don't want to poke through the fabric and I don't want someone to rake their skin on these over time. So I'm gonna take them out. And I think that's it. Okay, so this is kind of inside out still. So I'm going to place the top exactly where it needs to go before I start to fit it. I also want to make sure that this seam falls down the front of my chair everywhere it is. So when I go to pull this down, I'm like holding my hand on that seam so that it stays going down here. I'm going to do the same thing on this side. I really want those corners to fill out. You can also like add uh, material into those corners so that they stay filled out. I'm going to put a couple temporary staples in to hold it from side to side and to the corners where I need it. Whenever you're applying, you're ready to start putting your fabric on your chair, don't just start stapling one direction and go in a circle to the other. Because when you do that, your material twists and you're going to start to notice wrinkles and everything you don't want to see there. What my, I suggest is you lock it down in the centers first, center here, center in the back, sides, and then uh, center on the sides, and then pull everything into place it needs to go, make it nice and tight, and then you can start filling in the gaps in between. If you don't like pulling staples, this is a great way to avoid doing extra work. So I'm just going through making sure that seam is pulled down in the front, and I, I can already tell that I'm a little far back here, this is going to have to get hand stitched front here. Luckily I still have enough material. I'm going to use this tool poke out this corner. This is just my staple remover. It's pointy, so it will point out. I want to lock it down side to side here first and then pull it kind of back as far as it's supposed to go with a temporary staple before I go too far. So again, remember, a temporary staple, instead of going flat like this, you're tipping it to the side so that it, it goes in on an angle. Question just, here, the term, terminology, a clarification from TikTok, um, from Felix Hart, cushion cover or... Felix Hart! First of all, everyone stop what they're doing and go follow Felix Hart right now. She's an incredible upholsterer. She's in Texas. Okay, go ahead. Uh, cushion cover or seat, or is that a deck? So, so this, the seat part, that's a really great question, Felix Hart. The seat part of a seat is always a seat deck. This is the seat deck, uh, but when there's a removable cushion, the removable cushion is the seat, and then underneath that is the seat deck. But this is also the seat deck because it's the only part of the base of the seat. There's no removable part, so okay. this is the seat deck. Great, great question. Also, uh, Kevin Kyes. Oh my God! All my homies are here today. Hi, Kevin. Welcome. What's he say? You just said, darling, hello. Is all hello, Kevin. Uh, so Kevin is an upholsterer also. I think he started doing drapery. I remember he's in, uh, he's been in a lot of the same upholstery groups as me. Okay. Uh, and that's how I know him. And he's very supportive. He, I think he's in my group um, on Facebook. He's in a lot of, like he's in Kim's upholstery, upholstery group. Um, he does a lot of good work teaching upholsterers here. So I'm locking this down in the center with a temporary staple so that it doesn't travel before I make all my final movements and cuts. I'm pushing back all of the slack of the seat to the back of the chair right now and pre-tucking the sides before I fish this through. So I've got it locked down in the middle in the front. I also want to lock it down in the middle in the back. Uh, also, uh, um, Felix says, on an unrelated note, that blue is popping. There that is. <laughs> Thank you. It pops on TikTok, and it's way more desaturated on Instagram. Neither is an accurate uh, version of the actual color of the fabric. So I'm using my scissors to help me fish it through right now. You can use a plastic ruler. It's much safer. Uh, or um, a paint scraper. A plastic one can be a good pusher for fabric. These areas get pretty tight. So I'm just pulling it through the back, and maybe I will get this. Uh, I'm going to 
can get one of the cameras in the back and one in the front. So if you're watching on TikTok and Instagram, you can get two different angles right now. One of the front and one of the back. So you'll get to see everything kind of straighten out right here and then okay. come through the back on this side. Oh, it's going to be so nice. Hi, Randy. Now you want to be careful not to tear your fabric. I just heard mine threatening. <laughs> I'm going to tuck my sides in now before I do any more straining. Felix says, or icing spatula, my fave go-to. So an icing spatula is good for tucking fabric. Oh, okay. And also, uh, someone else agreed with Felix, the hair is gorgeous. Oh. Felix's hair? Because she's got gray hair. She's got pink hair. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, Last size, though. Lindsay, Lindsay is saying, the situation is why building Sawhorse platform is so useful. Got to get them all up in there. Yeah. Uh, someone else says getting up and uh, up close and personal with the chair. Yes, you're really getting into all the crevices. And I have carpal tunnel, so this part is actually decidedly difficult for me to pinch the fabric and pull and stretch. Yes. So, so here's a here's a question from Kevin. Love the arms. At what point would you decide to sue a collar, quotes, for the arms versus a relief cut? Just so a collar, oh, around here versus First a relief thing. cut. I've seen people do that. Um, when, sometimes when it's curved, when it's really curved around there, you'll want to sew an additional panel in around that curve so that it can hug the curve. Relief cuts are going to be fine on this because it's just a, a straight arm difficult to see in the condition it's in, but, okay, so now after you get it, well, we've got this way, this side left to go, I've got some foam showing up here, so this area's got to be hand stitched back that way, we knew that that was going to come unravel a little bit, so I'm not too unnerved by that, this side is looking good, but it's going to be stitched on the side, last side, I should be able to tuck and spread all this out, I am like winded, like this is physical labor, you guys, Nobody is out here doing upholstery because it's fucking easy. Because <laughs> it is not easy. Uh, Kobani Blue apparently is here as well. Who? Kobani Blue. Cool. Yeah. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming. We've been here a while. We've been here since 10 o'clock this morning. Uh, we've got a lot of questions answered, mostly. But we did manage to get this pattern cut for this chair. And get the seat upholstered, and as I expected, uh, this part probably won't even be done in time before my other fabric gets in here. So, <laughs> so everything's working according to plan. So I go here live every Tuesday for Tutorial Tuesday to just give you guys tutorials on the projects that I'm currently working on. So, um, if I have a project that I'm working on on Tuesday. I'll tune in and I'll walk you through just like I'm doing right now. I gotta get this one plugged in. Give me a minute. I gotta take a breather. And I might have to get some water because my voice box is about to die. Thanks, Thomas. Thomas is the best, you guys. Okay, so now we're just working on getting the rest of this material out. You're gonna have to use two hands for. It's very grippy in there. I mean, you gotta be real careful not to remove extra material or rip. some wrinkles in the back of the seat here that we need to go away before we put any more staples in. 
So that's what we're going to be working on here. Let me turn this guy around. There. I don't know where all the plastic cups we had from the party went, but they are. Oh, thank you. This is perfect. I love the plastic cup. But they're probably under the sink. That's why I found them in the past. Okay, so now I have the fabric in the back here wrinkled up, and I need to determine if, can it get stretched under? What is making it wrinkle? Can it be pulled out? And if not, I'll probably have to make some additional cuts. So this looks like it's everything is going to pull out. I got all my cuts around my armor looking good. They just got to be hand stitched up here in the corner. These little V's get tucked in. And I never staple my material down until the very, very end on the pull through spots. And that's so that I have like one last stitch effort to go through and tighten stuff up if I need to. So this all looks good. Nothing's buckling around the barriers. So I'm gonna start locking it down in place. I'm going to remove the staples that I already have um, and then put new ones in. And I'm trying to figure out the best angle for you guys to see this at. So, uh, Kim, one thing yes. you mentioned on Instagram, uh, she said, uh, well, Kim gets some water, I'm happy to jump on for two minutes. Oh. Uh, and I was going to say, whoops, the one time when having an intern in the room doesn't help. How so. can we, how can we, um, can we put her on? I, I don't know I don't how know. to do it. Can you invite her on there? I would love I, to do that. I know on, on TikTok it's possible. I know I'm saying it's not kind of do it. Can you like click it. on her name? Oh, you can't do it on yeah, yours. I'm I have on, to do it. I'm, yeah, I'm just, a, I'm just a lowly moderator. Okay. So. Go live with Madam of Making. Please. I hope if you're still here. Hope Thomas said fuck this up. <laughs> I got the one time we were trying to be helpful to that. It wasn't that long yes. ago. <laughs> you. Except. <gasps> there she is! Yay! Hey! Hi! Hey. Thank you so much for coming on. How is it? Is it translating? Is it, is it good? We've been here for probably like 90% of it. I've actually been working on my project. <laughs> on something you commented back but the first time you engaged with me I was like oh my god so <laughs> so nobody here knows that we're very excited about your presence here on the internet so, well what I lack in experience I am really really good at connections and like helping find those people and I'll have people message me all the time they'll send me a picture and be like oh, I've been working in this chair and it's like okay I know this person has that on their YouTube. I know this person's worked on that piece of furniture and kind of getting those connections made. Um, so that's kind of what the whole New Chair New Year challenge is about, is 
giving us kind of that opportunity to come together as a group, to do a project, to share some skills, to help people build up that foundation. And I think beyond like the foundational skills, it's that like something about sewing and upholstery is like terrifying for people. <laughs> it is. It, well, it's like, how do you do that? How do you make a furniture look like yeah. a furniture? Like, yeah. I get it. I, I see people like just deciding to retile their house and they get the tools and they figure it out. But if I talk to them about a sewing machine, they're like, oh no. <laughs> no, I'm, not I'm, me. It not is, me. And there's stuff happens and I'm super upset. And I think it's it's good because it kind of lets all of us kind of shine in our own areas mm-hmm. where I re- like to teach a lot of those beginner skills with sewing machines. The, I mean, again, just like breaking um, and and really showing people that you don't have to have a lot of fancy tools. You don't have to have an industrial sewing machine. I am not a shop that I'm working on upholstery 24 hours a day, year long. I don't so, have a shop either. I'm using a, my it, local maker space. Like yeah, this is a public space. Yeah. Anybody can use right. this space. I don't. I, my Which house is, is like a thousand square feet, and there's like four humans yeah. and a dog and two cats that live in there. There's no room yeah. for this at my home. Oh yeah, which I love because then it shows people, okay, whether I have a regular sewing machine, whether I have access to a maker space, whether I have an industrial machine, whether I really want to like dive in and start doing this full time for clients, you know, for friends, for family, however you want to do it, like that's kind of what this whole week is about. Yeah. So before I get out, because I know you've got to finish your project. Yeah, tell us what what are we expecting? What's coming up? Um we have two feature designers today. So you kind of took this morning block and then Michelle with Blue Ruth Cabin, she's going to be sharing her project, I think like an hour or so after you're done. Yeah. Um, so my stories all day kind of sharing about that. I know Rhonda was yesterday and she's going to be kind of going more in depth on her round pillow and the little tuff that she made in her stories throughout the week. Um, we still have myself, we still have Erica from Swatch Upholstery, Crystal from the Frederick House, Hannah from Renewed by Riley, like we still have a, a big lineup of people that are sharing some really fun projects throughout the week. And then um, on my day is Friday, Riley is on, or sorry, Hannah's on Saturday. Um, last year we had one prize per upholster that we were giving away and we had a grand prize. Everybody has just come in big this year, so I know you are giving away a huge package. I know Crystal's giving away some supplies. Um, Rhonda is giving away two of the books that you um, mentioned earlier, the Spruce books, which are great, great upholstery books. Um, I have four different prize packages that I'm going to be giving away, and we have a big So people just need to be tuning in. Um, if you have a project you're working on, whether you're a pollster, just starting out, beginner, um, maybe you have a chair that you bought and it just sits and stares at you and judges you from the corner of your garage. <laughs> Under the laundry. You have boost <laughs> to get it done. Share a picture of it. Make sure you're tagging me and using the hashtag New Chair New Year um, because there is a special prize package for people that are sharing with that hashtag. Um, so it's fun. It's a lot of fun. This has been awesome just to actually watch long format of your process. Like, <laughs> I'm over here, and it's just that's how it is. You yeah. know, every person I either collaborate with or watch their YouTube channels or uh, tutorials, it's like I'm always learning better ways, faster ways. And, and, and anytime I share anything, I'm like, this is how I have figured out how to do this. There's probably a better way. <laughs> If you know what it is, share it with me. Like I am very open. I do the same way, I'm... especially when the when the dinosaurs get in the feed and they like to remind you how to do things the right way. I'm always like, I am open to constructive criticism yeah. and to learning new things. I'm self taught and I don't know. I'm not formally trained, so I'm open to learning everything. But don't be a fucking dick about it because I'm not oh, yeah. into that. <laughs> the way my mind works, I have found that a lot of people's minds work that way. So oh like, yeah. Watch this like school or I take this class and I just could not like grasp that but because I have kind of a roundabout way that I approach things people are like oh I get that that you you know you're speaking my language so that's why 
this is awesome. Having all of these different upholsters with all these different experience levels that are just, I mean, like, literally just taking time out from their very busy schedules just to get people excited and more knowledgeable about upholstery. So, so thank you. So to win these amazing prize packages, all you have to do is, do you have to follow all of us or you just have to follow along? What are um, the rules? So on Saturday, there will be one reel that is posted that is the giveaway reel. So all of the rules, like, you know, you need to be following these people. Um, and then, you know, usually we just have you tag a person and the more people that you tag, like the more entries you get to win. So that one will be, you only have to enter in on one reel to be eligible for all of the prizes. So that one reel, we will draw the names from that From that reel. reel. The tag is a separate prize. So I will actually go in and pull the names of people that have shared with that hashtag. So that's why make sure you're tagging me so I can be writing them down, everybody that's actually sharing a project. And then that name will be drawn out of those. Prices. So when so you awesome. share the hashtag, new chair, new year, you get entered into a drawing to win some prizes. Perfect. And then when you catch that very special specific reel, which we'll know because it'll say in the reel, this is the very special specific reel, yeah. uh, then you can comment in that and then you'll enter to win some prizes as well. So I know that there's a ton of prizes. All seven of us are giving at least something away. I am giving away a Furniture Nerd uh, hoodie. Uh, so it's just a black hoodie that says Furniture Nerd on the front. I know you have a Furniture Nerd shirt. And then I'm also giving away a four class package, whether it be in person or virtual, whatever method you're able to get to me at, uh, so that you can get started on your first project with me. So I'm so grateful for you for doing this competition, for inviting me again for a second year to do it. I can't wait to see who else joins in, like, in, in further years, but I'm having a really great time doing this. I know I've gotten a lot of new followers from this. Uh, these two live sessions in particular particular are going very well. So <laughs> I've been blah, 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 since 10 o'clock this morning. You know, I'm definitely not going to have a voice by the end of the day. But uh, thank you. All the other upholsterers who are getting involved. Thomas Tusano, who was, is with Tusano Trading Company, is my, uh, what do you call it? What are, you're my technical guru today. He's moving around cameras for me to make sure everything's getting around. He's moderating my chats and all the platforms. We tried to get Facebook up here today too. I got very ballsy at the last minute today but we had a device failure so we're just we just get the two okay. streams but this has been amazing um i have had several people ask and i let them know this is going to be posted on instagram if they missed it yes so they can go back and watch it um and then you'll be sharing excerpts of it probably like throughout the week and on tiktok and correct like yeah if i can i mean if i can find a way to sh maybe i will put the um tiktok video and the instagram video on youtube raw i don't have time to edit them down but like these are like, yeah, so there's like a four hour uh, video. If you want to watch a four hour video, you friggin' can, man. <laughs> like I will enjoy the engagement. Uh, so I'll put it out there to make sure that everybody who missed it can watch it. But I've been really having a good time today. It's been going really well. We've had such great questions. We've had a lot of uh, celebrity upholsterers like yourself show their faces in the comments. So it's been a really cool experience. Thank you so much for having me. Fangirling over here. I'm like, oh, stop ah! it. <laughs> stop it. <laughs> okay, so follow everybody. If you go to Madam of Making's page, it's plastered with all the details and all the rules. Uh, you can go to our website too, it has more information there. Make sure you follow everybody involved if you want to win surprises. Um, I'm going to finish up this live today at 2 p.m. so that we can move on and the rest of the upholsterers can showcase their stuff. But I have the rest of this fabric coming in later and I've booked this room till 9 p.m. And this chair is getting done today. So I might be on here live for the finishing up process of this. We'll see how, how far we get with that. But I can let people know you're still kind of in and out. And then if people just, if they keep an eye on my stories because I'm posting it, then, then I'm kind of the hub for like sharing when people have posted, yeah. sharing links, uh, putting in question boxes for anything that got missed opening them up to the other pollsters, having them ask and answer as well, just because, like you said, we all have different resources and different experience levels. Um, so, yeah, I'm so excited. Excellent. I can't wait. Awesome. Well, I'm going to let you get to your project and stop procrastinating, <laughs> and I'll talk to you later. We'll see you. Bye, kids. Bye. Okay.
back to work people back to work that was fun that was Lindsay, you guys and if you've never met her before she is an incredible artist she doesn't just do upholstery on her page or furniture restoration for that matter she does so many different things she's such a crafty person so i highly suggest you find her here on tiktok facebook instagram she's everywhere so now i want to sort of lock down the front of this so that it doesn't go anywhere I am happy with where my front stable is. I'm not as happy with where these side stables are. So I'm going to take those out. Those are here in the side. They're temporary staples so I can get my um, staple remover in there easily. I'm going to do the same thing on this side. And I just want to readjust everything to make sure that it's nice and tightly fit the way that I want it to before I start drilling a bajillion staples in. So one thing to keep in mind is that I want this line to be straight across the front. So as I go to pull down on this side, I'm going to measure to make sure that that seam is in the same place from the frame here as it is on this side. So I need to get my ruler for that. And sometimes you can even make a template. I had a student, I don't think I have it. Oh, yes I do. So I had a student who had a three inch distance between here and here. So we cut a three inch square so that she could pull this down and it would line up with the frame exactly where she needed it. But I didn't make a template for that and I'm happy to just sort of measure this. So I have my staple in the center here and I haven't locked down anything in the back but you could staple it down in the back. The pressure of the seat is holding everything in place this way. I'm just gonna measure the distance from the seam to the staple here and hope it's a round number five and a quarter inches, round enough for me. So now I'm just gonna come over to this corner and I need this line to be lined up on my corner here. And from the seam, I'm going to measure five and a quarter inches and make sure that it lines up, like here is where the staple goes on this leg when we lift it up. There's a channel right here on the leg. You guys can't see it. This way, maybe we get on this side. I think we're gonna be okay with that plug. So I have to staple my fabric staples into this channel here. So first, I'll measure again to make sure that that staple is gonna go five and a quarter inches in, right into that seam. I'm also making sure that I'm getting rid of any slack from this middle staple to this corner of my leg. So not only am I pulling down, but I'm also pulling out. I don't want my seam to go beyond that corner. So if I still have any slack in between here, like if it looked like this, then I, there's something going wrong and I need to fix it. So there should be no wrinkles or bubbles in this area from this staple to here with this seam lined up in the corner where it needs to go. And then again, with the dropping of the ruler, I'm going to measure from this down to where it needs to go, and I'm going to put a staple at that five and a quarter inch mark inside that chip. And I'm also like keeping an eye on this line to make sure that it stays straight. Now in this channel, the staple goes straight across from side to side. Underneath, I'm stapling the staples diagonal to sort of hold this down flat. So I have that corner done. I'm going to come down here and do the other corner because we're evenly distributing. I don't want to pull everything here and then end up short on this side. So I'm coming over to this corner, pulling it over, lining it up with the seam. And then I'll be pulling from this staple to this corner to get rid of the slack on the front here and also pulling down to get that five and a quarter inch distance from the seam to where it staples into the chair. And that's it. So I don't have any wrinkles between these two spots. And now I can take from the center areas here, first I wanna make sure that my seam is pulled down in the front across the whole front. I want my seam to be poking down in this direction so you can't see it on top. And then from the center between these two staples is where I'm gonna pull this. Now you can see this is already starting to buckle up. 
So that staple isn't working out for me. It looks like everything slipped to the side. So I'm gonna take it out gently. I did not use a temporary staple. I was very confident that I wouldn't need it. And that can damage your fabric. So I'm gonna remove that. Pay attention again to make sure that it's pulled and stretched all the way over to this side where it needs to go. So now in between the centers here, I can use this wiping motion. I want all this fabric to go straight down. If I pull it too far to the side here, you'll see wrinkles start to come up on this side. If I pull it too far to that side, it's going to do the same thing there. Now, there is going to be a lot to be said when this starts to get pulled to the side. It's also going to stretch out the front of this. So I don't have to be too super picky. But before I can flip this fabric under and staple it, a little more in the front here. Before I can flick this fabric on your table, I have to trim it next to these legs so that this will fold forward. So that just went straight at the edge of the leg and stopped right at the frame. And now this material can tuck right back. So I use this wiping motion to sort of pull everything down. I can double check and measure that this seam is going to be stapled at five and a quarter inches underneath here. And I can even still use a temporary staple at this point to make sure it gets held in place. I'm going to do the same thing between these two staples. And I can see where that line limped up a little bit so I can pull that down straight so I can visually see that it's straight. But if you're measuring, then you should be able to get it in the right spot. So that's fine. That's looking good. Uh, this looks tall to me now, but it is not. That looks good. So now I want to go around my sides. I'm still not drilling staples into the side of this thing. I'm just evenly distributing the material around before I lock everything into place and regret all of my life's decisions. So there's still some turning back at this point if we needed to. Um, so that we don't have to redo everything that we did. So I'm going to remove the staple that I have over here because I'm going to readjust this, which is why I use that temporary staple. And we first want to get the height at the right spot, that five and a quarter inches from the seam to the edge of the frame. And then I'm also, I'm not just pulling down, but I'm pulling off to the side too. So I'm not just pulling down, but I'm pulling in this direction too. This split right here will have to get hand stitched, but I essentially want this to be five and a quarter inches. And then I can make that same snip around this leg here so that this can go this way. Now there's a channel around this leg for me to put staples here, but if you didn't have a channel, essentially what you're doing is you are putting staples end for end, like right next to each other here to create an implied line of this frame going straight here so that this can go straight across. That's where we're gonna put our welt, which is gonna clean up the area where the staples are. So I wanna make sure that um, that line is perfectly straight in line with my frame. So I'm going to first lock this place. You notice you're just sort of stretching everything across the front. And I don't want to pull this so tight that it changes the shape of the foam, that it pulls this down and divots it. But I also don't want it so loose that this gets loose and relaxed and wrinkled when you sit on it. So it's a, it's a fine balance of how you do it. You also don't want the staples to pull away when you go to sit on it. So this side is pretty stable. We're going to put a bunch more staples in there, but it's not necessary to put them all in at this stage. We can do all, a lot of that towards the end of it when we're closing everything up. Make sure the seam is down. Looking good. I need my measuring utensil. How's it going over there, Thomas? You got any questions? We have actually a comment from someone on TikTok saying it looks so good already. Oh, I'm so glad. Thank you. I'm glad that it's translating because it is still very hard work, uh, especially when you're sewing. I usually do seeds like 
this that are just like one seat, I do them as a wrap and staple. I don't sew the box cushion. It's way easier to do wrap and staple. So um, we're putting in a lot of extra work into this particular project. Now the goal is to have as clean lines as possible. So you want to check and eye level all of the angles to make sure everything is getting pulled in the direction that it needs to go. This is looking real clean. So I'll stay here. I've used very few staples at this stage, just so you guys know. I have, um, let's count them. So I've got four staples here. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, 13 staples holding this on right now. That is all, not very many staples to have to remove if you find yourself in trouble, which is good. So I think what we'll do, we'll finish stapling this on and then we're gonna sign off for now, but we're gonna be back later today to finish up the project. I'll probably get some stages ahead uh, before we get there, but we will be able to get the front and the back on this seat. So if you've joined me today and you're learning something and you're here and you're having a good time, all I ask is that you violently tap the screen as much as you can to give me as many likes as you can in this little short time that we're here laugh together. When you are tapping the screen and engaging in this content and sending my content out through your pages, through the For You page, through your feeds, so that people can find me and learn that I teach classes. I see uh, someone says, do you use quarter or quarter inch staples? I use quarter inch staples when I'm only doing one layer of thin materials. This is a half inch crown staple and it's a half inch length staple, 22 gauge, uh, because I have so many different materials that it's stapling through. We got fabric, we got batting, we got um, uh, the jew webbing that's already on there. So you wanna make sure that the staple is gonna bite. I only use quarter inch staples when it is going to really thin material. I also might end up having to use it if the wood that I'm stapling into is too thin for a half inch staple, like the staple would blow right out the back of it. Okay, so I'm gonna finish putting staples all the way around. And I do that the same way. I sort of lock things down in the center first. So I'm gonna lock, lock it down in the center on this side. And then I'm gonna to go to the other side and lock it down in the center there. Now these staples, they are just getting put right into the top part of this frame here. Nothing is gonna wrap over to the side of this chair. I'll bring you guys over here so you can see too. I want to uh, avoid, if I can, wrapping any materials to the side of this chair. So like all of this stuff is gonna get pulled out so that you can't see it because I don't want to bulk up materials here because this is my outer panel and I don't wanna be able to see that um, like through the upholstery fabric, which this is a kind of a heavy duty fabric, so you might not see that. And I'm pretty short on fabric here, but I, it is going to reach all the way down to the base. But first, I'm just going to lock it down here on the top in the center. I'm also looking at the top of my seat to make sure that I'm not pulling it in any weird direction. So I've got a couple in the center here, and now we're going to do a couple in the center in the back. that down in place while we think about the considerations for the rest of the staples. So after I get it down in the center, I'm going to stretch it from this side to this corner, put a staple in, and then from this side to this corner. I just want to make sure that this is not buckling up around the I think we're good. Okay, so I need to get rid of the slack between this staple and this staple, which means I can't staple it so that there's a bunch of baggy fabric. I've got to stretch it out. So it's going from this middle staple to the very corner. Now in the back here, the look of the staples doesn't really matter because you're not going to see them. Everything excess is going to get cut off so that you can't see it and it's all inside the frame. But what I will say is that a more stable staple is a diagonal staple. It's going to flatten that area down and it's going to hold the material in place better. So I'm just going to go through now from the center of this staple and this staple and put another one. And this is evenly stretching this material so that it doesn't get crowded and buckled in one area so you end up with a bunch of wrinkles. So now I can fill in the gaps between these staples and I'll probably put
put them every half inch. And I'll put these closer so you guys can see what that looks like. And now I can come back into a loose seat ball. And this one. Ooh, well, let's see, well, there. And I'll bring these close individually so you can see kind of what that looks like. The, so the these are the diagonal staples. Hold on one second. Let oh, me just sorry, sorry. show them this, and then I'll answer that question. Yep. Get this camera close. Maybe. So this is the direction of the staples here. So a diagonal staple this way is going to flatten out this area, which is good when we're putting stuff like trim out. We're not putting trim in this area, but that's a really good way to flatten out your material so that you can clean it up with trim really easy. Okay, go ahead, Thomas. Uh, how do you overcome limited space on the wood rail? On the, oh, on the wood rail down here. So if you, so there's a lot of problems. That's such a good question. Uh, if there's limited space on the wood rail, you don't want to just continue to pile on layer after layer after layer after layer. So you might have to get strategical about bringing your materials to the side and making sure that they staple up flat. I don't put staples in the batting when it comes through or the foam when it comes through. Those are just kind of loose as it comes through and the fabric comes through and gets stapled down to the frame. If I cannot staple it to the frame because either there's limited space or there's too many giant holes in it so the staples won't bite properly, I will bring it over nice and flat to the side and I will keep those layers as flat as possible. I try to only bring the fabric layer to that. If you're bringing on foam and batting, you're building up bulk in that area and your fabric is not going to cover it properly. All right, so now I'm going to stretch off to this corner, which is really short, but just long enough. And then a middle staple between this staple on the corner and the one in the middle on the diagonal. And then I can fill in the gaps in between those areas. And that side is done. I'm also going to flip it up. I don't want this fold to come outside of the frame because that all has to be flush. But I'm going to flip it up and put a couple of staples back to give this just a little bit of extra longevity and stretch to it. And if anyone ever needs to dig this upholstery out, there's a little bit of extra material for them to deal with here. I guess if they needed to repair, but still not a lot of material. I'm really cutting it close right there. So then you just cut the excess off. You want to cut the excess off of every layer as you go. You do not want these building up and having to cut through all of them at the same time. It will make your project look sloppy, and you do not want a sloppy project. So I'm going to 